People think that pain happens as we age. But the truth is, pain happens when we don't move our bodies the way it was meant to. When you learn to move your body the way it was meant to, then your body starts to feel good again. Welcome, we're so excited you're here. So let's get started. answer questions for three hours. So we are live right now at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and we're going to go till around 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where I'm going to answer as many questions as possible to help you feel better in your body, because that's our main goal at WeShape. That's my main goal as a coach, is to teach people how to move their bodies better so they feel better in their bodies. And today, that's what the focus is all about, all right? So if you are on one of our live streams right now, if you're on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, or Facebook, and you haven't put a question in, haven't signed up in advance and put a question in, then all you have to do right now to get your question put into this document 
and get those questions answered is leave a comment below right now. So leave a comment with your question and the more specific you are, the better, all right? If you just say, hey, what moves are best for my body? I'm not gonna know how to answer that question. But if you say, hey, I injured my shoulder doing this, I can't do these things, I feel tight here, it feels weak here, what do you recommend? That's gonna give me the context that I need to be able to come up with the best solution for you to try from the comfort of your own home to see if you can make your body feel better. So again, right now, if you're joining us, leave a comment in the, or leave your question in the comments below. Well, my team's gonna grab the question. Put them into my document right here, and I'm gonna do my absolute best to answer these questions for the next three hours, okay? So, um, how is this gonna work? I've organized some of the pre-questions into three categories, all right? The first category is pain. So when you're in pain, everything is harder, right? It's sucking the energy from your mind. It's preventing you from being able to move the body, your, your body the way you want it to move. And so I wanna help people get rid of pain. And the questions I have here are related to the foot, the ankle. We have a lot of questions about the lower back, SI joint, knees, shoulders, posture, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna answer a lot of questions about pain and give the specific movements and stretches that might help you feel better if you're experiencing these types of aches, pains, or injuries right now. Then I'm going to go on to strength and stability. So once we've talked about pain, I'm going to go into strength and stability, and we're going to talk about upper body movements for strength. There was a ton of questions related to the core. So I'm going to talk a lot about the core and teaching you the best movements to do to strengthen your core. And then we're going to go into flexibility. I'm going to show you my favorite movements to generate more flexibility in your body as well. And again, we're going to be going for like three hours. So there's going to be a lot of time to answer as many questions as humanly possible. So you don't have to stay the entire time. Stay until you get at least one piece of valuable content, one movement, one stretch that's going to help you feel significantly better in your body, and then apply that one thing. So before we jump in, that's the last thing I really wanted to say was don't take this video as I'm gonna watch it for three hours and I'm gonna do every single thing in there. So many people get blindsided by thinking they have to do so much in order to start feeling better in their body. And what you'll kind of discover, I think, throughout this Q&A is that less is more. Starting out smaller is better. Building a strong foundation with just a few things consistently is gonna take you so much further than if you do all the things that you think you should be doing all at the same time and then you give up because it's too much. It's too much for somebody to do, or you do too much too fast, and you end up hurting yourself, and then you end up back at step one. So let's stop doing that together, okay? Let's stop doing the, the race where we go one step forward, one step back, and instead, let's start taking baby steps forward and really building on a strong foundation so that you can improve your strength, your flexibility, your balance, your coordination, thus improving the aches, pains, and injuries you have, and making you feel better in your body. You can do it as long as you do it one step at a time, all right? And the final thing real quick, this is Cyber Monday. So for the people who are watching this live event, I do have a special deal for you. I'll share it in about 20 minutes and then we'll share it throughout the live Q&A. But today we are gonna start with questions and I'm gonna start with answering questions around pain. The first question is not quite a pain question, but I put it in the very front because I felt like it will help frame the context of a lot of these recommendations I'll be giving throughout, okay? So this was from Rosanna. And she said, how many days a week should we work out, okay? And this was such a useful question to start with, all right? I'm gonna be giving you recommendations for strength moves, for flexibility moves, and for relieving aches and pains. A lot of these recommendations are gonna be what we call movement snacks at WeShape. Now, a movement snack is something that you should be doing consistently every single day or even multiple times a day in order to restructure your posture, re-educate your body to move better. Because remember, when you move your body better, you feel better in your body. So if I'm sharing a movement snack with you, this is something that you should do every single day and ideally two or three times a day. And I know that sounds like a lot, but trust me, it's not. Most of these movement snacks take you only about one minute. So it's only a few minutes of commitment throughout the day. And I'll share with you some tips on how to make sure that you're consistent with these movement snacks. Now, if it's more of a strengthening movement or a workout centric question, that's about the actual workouts that you should be doing. Well, then you need to listen to your body. For most people, two days a week is, I think, a really good minimum goal to target for doing your workouts. If you do less than that, it's probably not consistent enough for you to experience an actual change in how your body moves and how your body feels. Now, if you go too many days a week, four or five perhaps, then you might actually be working against yourself as well by not giving yourself enough recovery time for your muscles, joints, tendons, ligaments to heal appropriately so that you can actually get benefit from the subsequent workouts. So I always say, start with two as a baseline and then listen to your body from there. Add a third day 
and take note of your energy. Are you starting to feel like you're losing energy and you're, you don't have as much strength and stamina? Do you feel like you're constantly sore and you never feel like your muscles are fully recovered? Well, then maybe three was too much for you. But maybe you go to three days a week and all you experience is you start to feel better faster. You start to feel like you're gaining strength and flexibility and balance and coordination faster than two days a week. And there was no downside to that. You're not consistently sore. You're not losing your energy. You're not sleeping poorly at night. Well, then guess what? Maybe three days is good for you. And you can always try four or five. The biggest thing is making sure that you understand that you need to listen to your body. Connecting with our bodies is so important when it comes down to feeling better in your body, all right? So remember <clears throat> that you have to work really hard on connecting with your body because when you connect with your body, you will be able to experience what it feels like to do the movements we're talking about. If I say do this movement and you don't ever drop your mind into those movements, then you're never going to be able to um, connect with your body in a way that allows you to repattern the movement so that you can feel better in your body. Because remember, it's not about all of a sudden going like, oh, I, I, I move like this, and then all of a sudden, um, I'm gonna move perfectly like this. It's about, I'm doing this poorly, and I finally built, became aware of it. And now I'm gonna start trying to do it better, and maybe 10% of the time I'll do it well, and 90% of the time I'll forget and do it the old way. And then over time, it becomes 80% you know, the old way and 20% well, and then 50% the old way 50% well. And eventually you start to move your body better because we're working those neural pathways that dictate movement. And when that consistently happens over and over again, we start to move our bodies better eventually without even having to think about it. That's when our bodies can feel significantly better. All right. So in summary, how often should you do these movements? If it's a movement snack every day, twice a day, maybe even three times a day. And the more you do it consistently, the better, but don't pick 10 movement snacks, pick one or two, right? And if it's a workout, start with two days a week and then listen to your body as you scale up from there. All right. Okay. This question is from Sam. Actually, we got, I, I lump these questions into categories. So this is one's from Sam and one is from Christine. Um, so Sam is having sharp pain in the bottom of her feet and wants to know how to change that. And then Christine has um, pain on the left foot at the top of the second toe and it's causing bad cramps. Is there a connection? She's talking about wearing wider shoes and doing some other stuff. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about cramps in a second, but let's start about the foot, okay? When I hear somebody talk about having aches in the bottom of the foot right here, especially if they're in the main line of the arch, okay? I think of what's called plantar fasciitis, okay? So I have this beautiful foot sculpture right here. If you can see this white band right here, this white band that's going from the top of the foot all the way down, it actually goes underneath the muscles and around here right there. That is the fascial band, okay? And this band right here, the design is, it's supposed to hold your foot together and it's supposed to provide a lot of support to your arch. Now, the problem is this. Oftentimes, people's muscles right here on the bottom of their foot will begin to atrophy because they haven't used these muscles in a long period of time. And when they atrophy, they tend to lengthen, which makes this fascial band have to do a lot more work, right? It's supposed to hold the arch up along with the muscles. The muscles stop doing their job. Now the fascial band has to do a lot more. And then all of a sudden we get inflammation in that fascial band and it can cause a lot of issues. So let's talk about the feet in plantar fasciitis. And let's talk about how to make sure the toes and everything else are healthy at the same time for Sam, Christine, and anybody else who's watching, okay? So to start out with for plantar fasciitis, I highly recommend you try this fascial release technique. So all you need is a spoon and some lotion. I've showed this a few times before, but it never ceases to amaze me how often this can work. And if you're having that pain across the arch of your foot right here, what you're gonna do is just put a little bit of lotion across the arch of the foot. Then you take the edge of the spoon, okay? And you're gonna just kind of grind the edge of the spoon up to the foot. And it might feel a little bit crunchy, might feel a little bit tender. And you're just gonna go up and down like this. Depending on how much you put the edge, the more that's, that'll cause a little bit more pain. The more you put the flat surface, the less pain it'll, it'll cause, right? But what you wanna do is not 100% pain. What you wanna do is scrape the muscle and try to get those um, lumps out of it, right? And what we're trying to do is create blood flow to this area. Now, if we do this consistently, at least once a day, we can start to create blood flow to that area, which can oftentimes help with the healing process associated with plantar fasciitis. Now, I wanna put one caveat on this, okay? Now, if you're doing this and you do this, and the next day, all of a sudden, you're like, wow, my foot hurts way, way worse, then the big deal about this is you might be causing more inflammation than is necessary, all right? So if that's the case and you're trying this movement out and it starts to cause more inflammation, it's not getting better, then this isn't the, this isn't the drill for you. Instead, try something different, which I'll show you here in just a sec. But for a lot of people, by doing this scraping technique across the bottom of the foot, again, we can bring blood flow to that area, which can help heal that area faster. Now, with plantar fasciitis, the, the, the first thing you have to also do is rest it, okay? I had plantar fasciitis one time, and I remember I kept thinking to myself, I was gonna be able to work my way out of it. I was just gonna put in different boots or an orthotic or whatever, and eventually that plantar fasciitis would go away. 
But guess what happened? It got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So try to minimize the amount of time that you're up on your feet for a short period of time, a week, maybe two weeks. Don't do a lot of calf raises where you're fully extending the foot like this. And instead, start working on reactivating the muscles of the arch so that way you can support that fascial band with the muscle tissue. I'm gonna show you how to do that one right now, okay? So I'm gonna bring this black box out. It's usually helpful for people to be able to see kind of what I'm doing here. <clears throat> and I'm gonna put my foot down on this box. Now there's a way to do this with a piece of paper where you can give yourself some feedback. And I've showed this in the past. We don't need to do that with a piece of paper right now, but what we wanna do is this. We wanna look at this arch right here of our foot, all right? If someone has a flat foot, basically this arch is pushed down. This muscle on the bottom of the foot is not active, just like we talked about, right? So if we're looking back at that, that foot here, right? This fascial band is doing all the work and these muscles are no longer active. So we wanna re-engage these muscles, all right? So this is something you can practice when you have plantar fasciitis. It is scrunching the arch. So what you're gonna do is this, put your foot flat on the ground, then you're going to scrunch the arch by lifting your toes and pulling the big toe towards the heel. Another way to think about this is this. Imagine if you're almost turning your foot inward like this, and it'll help get that arch active, okay? So you do this, you feel the foot, you feel the muscles underneath the arch. Now, put the toes back down and squeeze the ground with the toes while maintaining contact with the ball of the foot. This is really critical here. A lot of people will do this. They'll arch, they'll push their toes down, and then they'll lift the ball of the foot up like this. And even though you'll feel the muscles firing right here, that's not how we ever walk, right? We wanna be able to strengthen the arch with the ball of the foot down, then put the toes down and squeeze for a few seconds and then relax. So here's how this movement snack works. All you're gonna do is this, put your foot flat, activate the arch, spread the toes, grip the ground, hold for a few seconds and relax. Put your foot down, activate the arch, spread the toes, grip the ground with the toes, hold for a few seconds and then just relax, right? And you can do this for 60 to 90 seconds, ideally on each foot, and you can do this consistently every day, maybe a.m. and p.m., in order to start working on that arch activation. Now, just like with the spoon drill where we're doing some fascial release on the foot, if this causes more pain for you, then ideally you don't do it as much as I'm saying 60 to 90 seconds multiple times a day. Maybe you start with one arch activation, squeeze the toes, and then relax. And do that once every two or three days, and then slowly work your way up. I cannot stress enough how important it is that you start small and build a strong foundation. The reality is most people try to get done in six weeks, what they probably should be doing in six months. And so you do six weeks worth of work and then something happens that drops you back to square one and then six weeks go by, you do nothing maybe, and then you start over. And again, that's that cycle we get stuck in. One step forward, one step back. And after a while, that starts to get pretty dang exhausting. So if you take that six weeks of work you think you should be doing and you spread that out and you go slower, and you're more mindful about your movements, and maybe that takes six months. Well, guess what? At the end of that six months, you don't have to start back over. You can do another six months and another six months, and it's gonna make a huge difference in how you feel in your body if you're consistent and if you're patient. Patience, patience, patience. Something that I am horrible at as well that we all need to learn a lot more of. All right, let me get a sip of my tea real quick. Okay, next question. Um, <clears throat> All right, actually, I'm gonna go one more on the feet real quick, just while we're here. So again, that's a great way to activate the feet, work the arches. If you feel like you're able to activate your arches, I wanna show you guys one more move that's really, really good. And this is gonna be called the calf rocks. Why I like this move so much is you can do this anytime, anywhere, all right? And it looks like this. All you're gonna do is sit in a chair, or if you're laying, you can bend your knees, right? And what you're gonna do is push your toes into the ground as much as possible until you feel your calves firing, so you're all the way up on your toes. And then bring your toes to your nose as much as possible until you feel the muscles on the fronts of your shins firing. All you gotta do is go back and forth. Toes to, toes to the ground, toes to nose. Toes to the ground, toes to nose. Just back and forth like this until you get a nice pump in your lower legs, which for most people, again, should take 60 to 90 seconds. Now there's a couple ways you can make this harder. You can stand up and do it and you can use a chair next to you for support where you're just doing 60 to 90 seconds like this. And eventually if that feels too easy, again, using a chair for support for balance, you can shift your weight to one leg and go toes to nose, toes into the ground and really strengthen the ankles and the feet quite considerably by using this one simple movement. And if you can't do any of these things and you're laying in bed, you, maybe you can't even sit up in bed, all you gotta do is pump the ankles in bed, right? So just pumping the ankles by pointing the toes, 
and then toes to nose can be such a fantastic way to get blood flow, to move lymph through your ankles, to strengthen your feet, to strengthen your ankles, to create more flexibility in your ankles. So um, don't, ask, don't underestimate the simple things. This is such a simple thing that you can do consistently, like while you're working at your desk, while you're watching TV, and it's something that can really make a big difference on your feet and your ankles, okay? <laughs> okay, we're gonna talk a few questions about the shoulder. I'm gonna show you some stretches and some movements about the shoulder. So this one is Jude, Shelly, and Joanne, all right? So Jude had a question about um, a tight right shoulder and the pain triggers down to the wrist, okay? Sometimes having to take a painkiller. Um, Shelly had a question uh, about the shoulders and spending a good bit of the day with the arms reached out in front and the shoulders rounded forward and can't reach the arms overhead, right? Have a hard time with range of motion um, in the elbow joint as well. So I'm gonna work through some shoulder stretches. And then Joanne had a calcium buildup in the shoulder that she's awaiting surgery for, and the posture is really bad. So this has a lot to do with shoulder and posture. So I'm gonna start out with um, Jude's kind of specific question, which is related to pain shooting down your hand and in your shoulders. Okay, so Jude, when we have shoulder pain and we have like that nerveness or that pain shooting down into our hand, anytime I hear the word shooting or tingling, immediately what I'm gonna go to is nerves, okay? If our nerves aren't working well, then we are gonna have that tingling, that shooting pain. And so what usually that's related to is an impingement, an impingement in our spine. So I'll bring Shelly over here for a second. <clears throat> Everybody can take a look at Shelly's spine right here. Sorry, Skelly, ah, Skelly's spine. I called her Shelly, like a turtle. All right, so in there you see all these nerves, right? These little yellow nerves that are kind of innervating through the spine. As we get older, if we have bad posture, we don't work on our core strength, we don't work on our posture, these discs in the spine, they start to compress. When they compress, these nerves get pinched. When these nerves get pinched, we get shooting pain, we get tingling. When we have shooting pain down the wrist, we're talking about these nerves up here that are somewhere in the middle of your shoulder blades up into your neck that are potentially being pinched to cause that pain. And so what do I like to focus on? Well, first, I like to focus on making sure that we have what's called thoracic flexibility. So thoracic flexibility basically means that we're not rounding our shoulders forward like this, and we have no ability to rotate our spine from side to side, and that instead, we have the ability to extend our upper back, and we have the ability to rotate our upper back, okay? So here's some of the movements I would try if I had some nerve issues um, in my upper back. So number one is going to be a seated rotation. So what you wanna do is this, sit in a chair, bring your feet and your calves real flat against the chair like this with a nice tall posture. What you want is everything from your rib cage down staying pretty still. So as you turn and do this rotation, I don't want your hips turning or lifting like this. I don't want you compensating through the lower back. I want you to think about everything from the ribs down stays in one spot and almost all of the movements coming from the ribs up in the upper back and through the neck, okay? So here's how the move looks. I'm gonna take one hand, I'm gonna cross it over my leg and I'm gonna put the other hand either behind my butt right here if you're not very flexible or if I can, I'm gonna put it on the back of the chair right here. Now from there, I'm gonna constantly think about tall posture. Remember what I said about the discs? When they get compressed, they create pain in the nerves. So tall posture is key. So always think about pushing up towards the sky with the top of your head. You know those old uh, movies, you'd probably see somebody with a book on top of their head to work on their posture. Well, that was a really good idea because when we push up to the top of our head, we create space inside the discs, okay? So in this position, all you're gonna do is take a big breath in. And then as you exhale, try to look a little bit further with your eyes. I don't want you to discount this breathing technique. Now, a lot of people, when I tell them to breathe like this, they're gonna go like this. And you're barely gonna be able to hear it. The more we let the breath out in a relaxing way, the more we're going to relax the muscles. And the physiological sigh is one of the best ways to encourage the body towards relaxation. So instead of going like this, right? We wanna go like this. Big breath all the way in. And you, you'll know you're doing it right when people look at you weird, okay? That's when you'll know you're actually exhaling to the degree I'm asking you to exhale for. So what I want you to do in this position is hold the stretch for 60 to 90 seconds, doing those big inhale exhales, <sighs> leading with your eyes, trying to turn a little bit more and trying to move again from the ribs up. So we're trying to create that space in the upper back. All right, now once you've done one side, unwind it a little bit and we'll go to the other side. So hand across to the other leg. Hand can be behind the chair, and you can use this hand for support as you turn, or if you can, you can put your hand all the way up on the chair and continue turning. <laughs> Same thing, 60 to 90 seconds, big breath in, and then uh, as we rotate our body. 
And again, you're leading with your eyes. So as you do that inhalation, and then you exhale, look to the side with your eyes that you're trying to rotate and allow your body to keep turning and turning and turning, trying to get that mobility in the upper back to make the upper back feel significantly better, all right? So keep doing that rotation. That can be a really great way to get that thoracic um, rotation that can create space inside the spine, okay? Now I'm gonna grab a foam roller here, and you don't necessarily have to have a foam roller or a foam ball. There's like a lot of different ways to do this, but oftentimes we have so much tightness in the upper back that getting a foam roller or a foam ball can be a really great thing to create that thoracic extension. But I will also show you one thing that a lot of people make a mistake on here that I wanna make sure that you don't make a mistake on, all right? So um, you're gonna put this foam roller about in alignment with the bottom of your shoulder blades towards your upper back, okay? So bottom of the shoulder blades is right here. Now, a lot of times when people try to create thoracic extension, what they're gonna do is this, watch my lower back. They're gonna go like this. They're gonna lift the lower back as high as possible. So my lower back just here, I'll put my hand right here so you can see even better, here's my hand. So I'm here and I'm gonna lift my lower back to try and create space in the upper back, all right? We don't want that. What we wanna do is this. We wanna think about dropping the lower back into the ground as we create thoracic extension. So think about ribs staying down. And the best way to do that, I've always taught, is cough, right? <coughs> Hold that position. <coughs> Hold that core position right there. Now, arms come overhead with that foam roller right at the bottom of the shoulder blades, and then you're gonna lift your hands towards the sky like this, all right? And you can play around with the spot. You might roll down a little bit. Wherever you feel the stretch coming through your rib cage into your shoulders, that's where you can do this stretch. Now, if this bothers your neck at all, then what you can do is put a nice cushy pillow behind your head. I don't want your neck being hurt by doing this movement. So again, the most important thing is not to arch the lower back, but to press the lower back down and then try to create thoracic extension. From here, you can just kind of do little movements up and down. You can try to create space inside those vertebrae. You might even feel a couple pops and cracks. You can come all the way up to the top of the traps if you want to, each time resetting by pushing the lower back into the ground and trying to create that space in the upper back, okay? Now, if a foam roller is not doing it for you, then you can always try using a massage ball. This is almost the exact same technique, the difference here is that the massage ball will be more isolating and it'll allow your shoulder blades to open up more so it can give you a deeper stretch. Best thing to do is if you have aches, pains, and injuries, go on Amazon, get yourself a simple foam roller and a simple massage ball, nothing fancy, just the cheap ones on there and you can get it in a couple days and then you can start playing around with this and seeing if it starts to help you as it relates to the muscles that are tight. Okay, so this one, same thing. You're gonna get it on the spine, only this time, instead of coming right into the middle of the spine, I'm gonna pick one side. Right, so if I'm on the side like this, I'm gonna put my spine next to the ball, then I'm gonna put the muscles next to the spine on the ball. I'm gonna do the same thing, push the lower back into the ground, bring the arms overhead like this, and I'm gonna just kind of play around the position, rolling the ball up and down my upper back. You might even do little kind of moves like this. You might play around with your arms, crossing your arms over your belly, opening your arms to the outside, bring your arms down, play around until you find the spots that feel a little bit tight and tender, almost like um, a button that feels like, woo! And then once you find those buttons, you can just kind of roll back and forth like this, and you can start to loosen up those areas of your upper back. So using the massage ball is probably one of the best techniques I've ever found for loosening those muscles of the upper back and allowing a little bit more thoracic extension. Now, if none of this stuff sounds good to you, then we can work on thoracic extension a little bit differently by just coming down to our bellies. And you can do this in bed. I highly recommend you do a lot of these things in bed because then you can set up a routine where before you get out of bed, you just do the routine, right? So <clears throat> in this position, you're gonna just start on your belly, right? You can just let your hands rest on your, your, your forehead like this. And then what you're gonna do is squeeze the glute muscles. It's really important that we squeeze the glute muscles before we extend the spine because they're gonna protect the lower back. And then as we lift, I want you to imagine not just lifting your head towards your heels. Imagine lifting your chest forward and up, okay? So if we're gonna lift our head towards our heels like this, ah, we're gonna create compression. We're compressing the spine. Everything I just said, remember, is about length, okay? So instead of that, we're gonna go length. Squeeze the glutes, lift the chest, almost like you're pulling your hands forward as they're assisting you and getting a little bit of thoracic extension. Now, this might be hard for a lot of people to hold for very long, so you can only hold this one for a few seconds, that's fine. Hold for a few seconds, come down, relax for a few seconds, and then come back up, hold for a few seconds, come down, and relax for a few seconds. And over time, what you can do is you can start to come up more, and you can start to come up more, and start to come up more, and start to come up more, and start to walk the hands up more, until you get that extension in the thoracic spine, actually the whole spine, right, that you're after, okay? Now, when I say over time, I said you can do this over time and get more flexibility. 
Over time means over the course of a year, two years, et cetera. So don't expect to go from rounded upper back to being able to fully extend the spine super quickly. Spend a lot of time in this position, really extending the upper back, and that's gonna help you create that flexibility faster. Now, I do wanna talk about one more concept that I talk about here in this position, which is tummy time, okay? Um, when we have little babies, we put them on their tummies, and you know why we do that? We do that to strengthen their posterior chain. We do that so that the baby can start developing the strength in the neck, in the upper back, and the lower back to be able to do this extended position, and then they can come up to their knees and they can start crawling, okay? But we never do this as a grown-up, right? So I think one of the best things you can do for yourself is start building tummy time into your routine. So if you read a book, if you work on a laptop, if you're ever in a position where you're gonna be sitting for you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes in one consistent place, try inserting tummy time. And what you'll do is this, set a timer and start with something really simple and palatable. Again, you should be starting with something that is so easy that you barely notice it. So maybe one or two minutes of tummy time where you're just reading in this position with your elbows into the ground for one to two minutes. And the big thing here too is don't do it passively like this where your shoulders are shrugged up and your neck's all tight. Your shoulders should be dropped away from your ears. Your butt should be squeezed lightly and your chest should be lifted as you're doing this. And you're thinking tall to the top of your head. And then, you know, do two minutes for the first week once a day. Then do five minutes and then do seven minutes and then do 10 minutes and slowly work your way up to the point where you're doing, you know, 20, 30 minutes at a time in this tummy time position so that you're encouraging that thoracic extension. Because remember, a lot of the times, the reason why we end up with aches and pains in the first place in our upper back is because we sit like this all day long and our posture's like this and we're always rounded forward. So we need to build in time to have more extension, okay? So <clears throat> that first part was for you, Jude, was talking about that upper back and getting that upper back looser by doing some foam rolling, by doing some uh, massage ball, by doing the thoracic rotational movement, by doing thoracic extension movements. A lot of that stuff should be really helpful. One more thing I could show here would be um, making sure that you have length in your spine, okay? So my favorite way to do that is if you have a, a door jam, you can buy one of those little pull-up bars that you can put up in the door jam and you don't have to hang from it, you don't have to do pull-ups, but just grabbing onto that pull-up bar and just kind of letting your weight sink and letting the shoulders and letting your spine drop almost like you imagine something's hanging from your tailbone and pulling down, that's gonna be like the most beneficial thing for you when it comes to creating space in your discs and length in your spine. And if you don't have any space to do that, as in, again, like a pull-up bar or something like that, well then guess what? What we can do is you can take a chair and put it in front of you, and I also call this the sink stretch. You've probably seen me do them before. But the sink stretch is where you basically grab onto your kitchen sink, you grab onto a chair or whatever, and what you're gonna do is basically bring your arms down and your shoulders up, and you're gonna let your butt sink backwards, and you're gonna think about your length from your fingertips all the way to your tailbone, and almost using like gravity. So you're gonna sit back almost like trying to use gravity. A lot of people, this is too far down. That's why a sink's a little higher, usually gives you good range of motion. But doing that stretch several times a day to get that flexibility back in the upper back, in the shoulder blades, um, and it also just creates space in the spine can be incredibly helpful for you. All right. Um, we're going to talk about shoulders here in a second, but I did promise something. I said, if you watch for about 20 minutes of our live Q&A, that I was going to tell you guys about the Cyber Monday deal that we're doing. So yes, we are here trying to help as many people as possible for free to feel better in your body. But I find a lot of times people listen to this content and they go, what do I do next, right? And it feels confusing because I gave you guys everything in the kitchen sink up front, right? Well, at WeShape, what we've done is we've created a software that can use your feedback to generate a personalized at-home workout just for you. And we've built this workout system to be adaptable to people who are all the way from not even being able to sit up in bed to someone who is more athletic and can do explosive activities. And the goal was to create a system that felt like you having a personal trainer only for a fraction of the cost. And today, it's an even bigger fraction of the cost because if you wanna try WeShape out, you can try our personalized at-home workouts out and you can get access to myself personally, Coach Tyler or Dr. Lisa as well during our live Q&A halls, calls that we host every single week where we get on Zoom calls with our members. We do this type of troubleshooting with you to help you know the best movements for your body and also help you use the workouts that we've created for you more effectively, all right? So right now on Cyber Monday until midnight tonight, you can save 65% off any plan, 65% off, all right? So if you're going a yearly plan, that could save you several hundred dollars and you could have a program, a workout program, plus a supported community, plus free access to our, um, our, our uh, feel-good challenges, 
plus live Q&A sessions with myself, with Dr. Lisa, also our We Share calls with our other We, um, we Care coaches. And you can get all of that right now for 65% off and you can have all of 2024 pretty much covered, right? So if you're already scratching your head thinking, what am I gonna do for 2024? Well, this is a good opportunity for you to lock in with WeShape and get plenty of stuff for the rest of this year and almost all of next year as well, okay? So all you have to do right now is if you're on YouTube and you are on Facebook, you can click the link above or below. That'll take you to that discount page. Remember this expires at midnight tonight and then it's not coming back, all right? And then if you are on TikTok or Instagram, you can click the link in the profile. Or if you're watching this live feed right now and you just want to go type it in, it's weshape.com backslash question, the word question, right? And that will save you 65% off any We Shape plan. And again, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions, build you a personalized workout. And then what we've done is the workouts actually ask you questions to make sure that we're constantly adjusting the movements to make sure they're appropriate for you. And the frame that I had when I was thinking about this product was, it should feel like a personal trainer where you start doing something in front of a personal trainer and you're like, this doesn't feel right. And they're like, okay, try this instead. And they give you something that feels more appropriate to you. So that's our goal to make sure you feel like the workouts that were created for you are the ones that are appropriate for you to help you build strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination, which is really the attributes that help you feel better in your body. Again, click the link above or below or in our profile or go to weshape.com backslash question and you can save 65% off any of the plans. And that's good until midnight tonight. Monday, November 27th, all right? Let's get back to the questions here. Okay, so now let's go a little bit more into the shoulder. I wanna talk a little bit about how to increase that range of motion in the overhead position and to the side positions, and also as it relates to improving posture, okay? So I already did the sink stretch where you bring your arms overhead and you pull your body back and you sink your sternum between those arms. That's one of my favorite stretches for getting the flexibility back and also creating length in the spine as it relates to getting your arm to be overhead like this. Now. A lot of people end up sitting for such a long period of time that our posture goes like this. And when our posture goes like this, we think that maybe we can't get our shoulders or our arms all the way overhead, but really what's happening is all the muscles here, our chest and our ribs are not, the, are not loose enough to be able to let the thoracic spine extend. So if I, if I have a rounded back and I lift my arm and I go, I can only get it to here, but now imagine this, I can extend my back. I didn't have to lift my arm anymore. I just had to extend my back more. All right, so if that's you, you're having trouble getting your arm overhead, sink stretch and the thoracic spine stretches that I already showed are gonna be really important for you. But I've got another one for you because one of the biggest problems with people having bad posture is their ability to open their chest like this. Now this is literally the stretch that I do more than any stretch on the planet. If you follow me around for a day, you'll see me do this stretch probably 20 times or more throughout the day. And the reason why is it's so easy it's so quick and it does so much for the body to improve the posture and create that flexibility in the shoulders, okay? So if you're watching right now, put your phone, your iPad, whatever you're watching, lean it up against something and follow along this one stretch for just 10 seconds. I promise you, if you can make this a habit, it's gonna be a big deal. So come to the edge of a chair. If you're standing, that's fine too. All you're gonna do is this. You're gonna take your hands and you're gonna either clasp them behind your back like this. And if you can't do that because you're too tight, that's fine. Just put your hands on the outsides of the chair with your fingertips pointing out. Now from there, what you're gonna do is this, just lift the chest toward the sky, drop the shoulders away from the ears so we're not shrugging the shoulders up like this, we're dropping them away from the ears and just continue lifting the chest as much as possible, lifting the face toward the sky, we're thinking length, squeeze the shoulder blades together so I'm actively pulling the shoulder blades together, pushing my shoulders away from my ears, lifting my chest, hold for just one more second and then come down slowly and relax. How does your shoulders feel right now? How does your postures feel right now? How does your postures, <laughs> how does your posture feel right now? Probably should feel significantly better already. And that was just 10 seconds, okay? So the simple movement of thoracic extension, of clasping the arms behind the back and lifting the chest, which again, if I come to a standing position, right? All you have to do is put your hands behind your back, right behind your tailbone, lift your chest, open your chest like this as much as possible. And then you can do that same stretch from that same position, okay? So you can do this seated, you can do this standing. Now here's the deal with this stretch. If you make this a part of your life, it's gonna correct most of what is wrong with sitting. It'll even loosen up your hip flexors, which is tied on most people for sitting because we're sitting like this, the hip flexors get really short. But you gotta do it consistently, okay? And in order to do it consistently, you gotta start building a habit around this. So I wanna give you a really special hack right now that I've told a lot of people about that when you do apply it, it's gonna be a game changer for you, okay? You can open up your, your phone right now and you can go to your alarms section. Now what I want you to do is this. I want you to set an alarm 
at least three times a day, maybe more, maybe five, maybe even 10, all right? And just set an alarm to have it ding and go off and say, shoulder stretch, right? Shoulder stretch, that's it. And I want this alarm to go off and I want this alarm to become your reminder for the next 30 days, okay? Just 30 days of this alarm going off. I know it'll get a little bit annoying at first, but if you do it for the next 30 days, even five times a day, that's 150 times that you've done this stretch. If you end up doing this stretch that many times, it's gonna start to become a part of your daily life. And that consistency that you start building is gonna mean whenever you're feeling tight in your upper neck, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm noticing I'm tight in my upper back or my neck or my shoulders. And you're gonna go, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh my gosh, I feel so much better. And that consistency can start to reshape the way that you hold your body in space and the way that you hold your posture when you're sitting or standing, okay? So do that right now if you have a, a tight upper back, if you have tight neck, tight shoulders. Open your phone, set those alarms to go off once a day, you know, morning, couple in the afternoon, evening before bed, and just as a reminder, just as a, as a useful tool, you know, I, could, I don't think technology is the most helpful thing in the world. Sometimes it gets distracting from, it distracts us, takes us out of the present, you know, makes us feel bad about ourselves by showing all these ideal situations, but you can use it in a positive way. And this is one of those ways. Set that alarm to remind you three or more times per day for the next 30 days to do this stretch. And I promise if you start building that habit, you're gonna continue doing this because it feels so good. All right, I'm gonna come back with one more concept on that before we get to the last, last stretch for the shoulders here. Mm. You'll notice <coughs> at the end of that, I said, because it feels so good, okay? When we work out to change the way that we look and we punish ourselves because of the food we ate or we punish ourselves because we hate ourselves because we hate the way we look, all we're doing is showing up for our workouts from a place of negativity, from a place of fear and insecurity. How long do you think you'll be motivated to be consistent? when it's fueled by fear, insecurity, and negativity. Huh? How long? Probably not that long, right? We don't do things consistently when it feels negative. So part of what we try to do with WeShape, part of what we try to preach to people, is instead of showing up for your workouts to change the way you look, instead of showing up for your workouts out of this fear-based mentality, this negativity-based mentality, show up for your movement snacks, for your workouts, for your stretches, because you want to care for your body, because you deserve to have a body that feels good, and because you want to feel good in your body. So, so much of what we do at WeShape is do less than you think you need to do and walk away from your workout, from your movement snack, whatever it is, feeling good, feeling positivity. So that way, when you think about moving your body, when you think about working out, you don't think about it in the context of like, oh gosh, I have to go do this super challenging thing that I don't wanna do and blah, blah, blah. You go, wow, I get to go take care of my body. And something I continue to say to people is when you show up to take care of your body, doing movements for your body to feel good with the same attitude that you show up with brushing your teeth for, right? When you show up to brush your teeth, you're like, ooh, I wanna take care of my teeth, right? When you can show up to do your stretches, oh, I wanna take care of my upper back and my neck and my shoulders, right? That's the energy we wanna have. That's the energy we wanna have. We wanna take care of our bodies. We don't want to judge and criticize and hate our bodies, all right? So hold that in your mind as we continue going through these movements. I wanna reframe a lot of this because a lot of times our lack of consistency is built around our lack of ability to show up for ourselves in this way of positivity and kindness and desire to care for your body rather than judge your body and change your body, all right? Okay. So I got one more, I was talking about this, the chest. We're gonna open up the chest. I'm gonna show you how to do this on the floor, but I'm also gonna tell you real quick, and I'm gonna start on the wall just to show you. You can do this stretch on a wall. So I, you guys don't have to film this super deep, but all I'm saying is you can do the same stretch on a wall standing like this, where my arm is up to the side, as you can do it on the floor. I'm gonna do it on the floor because I like that personal version better. And I think, again, I said this earlier, I highly recommend that you do this from bed, okay? If you set this routine in bed, then you can just do this in the morning before you get out of bed and it'll be awesome, okay? So let me move some stuff real quick. I'm gonna show you this stretch. This is my favorite stretch for loosening up the chest. So what you're gonna do is come down to your belly. And you can, again, you can do this in bed. And you're gonna come into this position with your hand out. I like to turn my thumb towards the sky. That's gonna put my shoulder in that external rotation, which is where I really wanna get that, that flexibility and that stretch, okay? 
Now in this position, what you can do is just relax your head. If you need to put a pillow under your head, that's fine too. And then bring this arm, the free arm, out to the, out to the chest, right? Like right here. Now from there, what you're gonna do is this. You're gonna start to roll over this direction and you can do this. You can either push off of your knee and your arm until you feel a stretch and go, whoa, that's plenty, right? I've got plenty of a stretch there. Or you can roll all the way to your side like this and you can even put your foot up like this if you want to so that you can bring your body into that deeper stretch. Or if you want to, you can even take the leg and you can swing it over to the backside and use that to help you create more gravity pulling that stretch across the chest. Now, this is gonna be like the more advanced variation. So for a lot of people, you're probably gonna feel a pretty deep chest stretch right here, okay? That's totally fine. In this position, for 60 to 90 seconds, inhale, remember the exhale. Remember to breathe out that big exhale and try to turn and look a little bit more with your eyes. Again, if you need a pillow to support your head for support, that's 100% fine. And to hold this for 60 to 90 seconds, we're not gonna do the full length today, and then slowly bring your body back down to a flat position and just immediately notice right there what the difference is between the side you stretched and the side that you haven't stretched. You're gonna feel like, wow, this shoulder is so flexible. My posture feels more naturally open here. Everything feels better on that side and everything probably still feels tight on this side. So let's stretch the other side for just at least 30 seconds to make sure you guys are even if you're following along. So again, elbow a little bit higher than your shoulder for most people. You can play around with this position. You can play around with the bend of the elbow. Go to the place that you feel the deepest stretch, okay? Now, find that position, relax your head, bring the other arm next to your chest, roll to the side, use your knee for support, use your leg for support, whatever you need to do for support, okay? And then open the chest, and then we're gonna do the big breath in. And then we're gonna let the big breath out. Ah, as we continue to rotate towards the side like this. Oh, stretching the chest like crazy. Ah, that's such a good stretch, I love this one. I love to do this stretch, okay? Again, you can hold this for 60 to 90 seconds, doing those deep breaths, trying to look over your shoulder with the eyes and rotate even more on each stretch or each, um, each breath. And come back down, let it go, and then remember to do this stretch consistently. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the shoulders right now. We've talked a lot about the posture, creating thoracic extension, creating that, that ability to rotate the thoracic spine, opening the chest, doing the sink stretch, right? Now I've got one more concept for you that's really important. This is a really important movement practice for people who are struggling to bring their arms overhead pain-free. Now, if it's 100% about your, your posture, well, then we've got to fix your posture first, and then we can talk about this. But this is really something that, that you can start practicing throughout the day that's going to help you learn how to bring your arm overhead using the appropriate muscles, okay? So the first thing I want you to do is this. I want you to bring one elbow towards your ribs, and I want you to take your hand and put it underneath your elbow like this, okay? Now, what I want you to do is this. I want you to push up on the elbow with this bottom hand right here and come up to like about a 90 degree position where your elbow is like in the front. And I want you to drive your elbow into that hand as much as possible while pulling the shoulder blade back, okay? So shoulder blade back, elbow pushing towards your thigh like this. What I want you to do is I want you to feel the muscles that are active right now. The muscles that are active right now are gonna be your lat, your serratus. They're the muscles that bring the shoulder down and back into place, okay? So feel those muscles for a second. And then go to the other side for a second and feel those muscles again, same thing. Okay, can you activate those lats? Can you feel those muscles? Armpits, kind of down here. Core a little bit as well. Now, we want to use those muscles to protect our shoulder. A lot of times when people bring their arm overhead, they do this. They bring their arm overhead, and as they get to about halfway point, maybe just underneath their shoulder, they'll internally rotate their shoulder, they'll roll their shoulder forward like this, and they'll go to lift their arm overhead like this. And what do you feel? Do the same movement. Shrug your shoulder and turn your thumb towards the ground. What do you feel? Ouch, pinchy. Ouch, my neck. Ouch, my trap. So effectively what you're doing here is you're using these muscles here, your neck and your trap muscles. You're using those muscles to lift your, your arm over your head, to lift through the shoulder, right? What we wanna do is this. We wanna drop the shoulder blade back and down. We wanna use the muscles of the shoulder to lift the arm while using the muscles of the lats and the serratus and the core to stabilize the shoulder. When we internally rotate and lift with the neck and traps, we put our shoulder in a compromised position, we put our upper back in a compromised position, and we put our neck in a compromised position. But when we drop the shoulder down and we activate the lats, then we pause right here, we keep the lats activated, and we begin to lift our arm overhead with the shoulder down away from the ears, using the shoulder muscles, then we can bring our arm overhead all the way, pain-free, 
using the appropriate muscles and not overactivating the neck and the traps, causing more tension in our necks, right? So how do you practice this? Well, again, to start out with, you build the awareness of the lats and the serratus and all the muscles in your armpits. It's probably easy to say all the muscles underneath your armpits, right? So just hold, hold. Okay, that's what that feels like. Now, get the active muscles, let go, keep the active muscles, straighten the arm, and then you start to go up like this. And the moment that you notice yourself shrug the shoulder, pause, drop the shoulder, get those lat muscles reactivated, and then start to lift again. And then what you'll notice is your, your bad movement will come back in. You'll shrug the shoulder. Oh, wait, hold on, pause, drop the shoulder, and see if you can go up a little bit more. And at first, it might be really challenging. You might not be able to go very high, and that's totally fine. But the point of this is, is if you're having issues with getting your arms overhead in a way that's pain-free, or if you just felt that when I, when I talked about it, when I said, lift your arm over your head, and you went, oh, that's exactly what I'm doing. Well, guess what? It's gonna become painful at some point. Then you gotta start practicing the ability to lift those arms overhead in a way that's pain-free without overusing the neck and the trap muscles, using these muscles to stabilize the shoulder capsule, and using these muscles to actually lift the arms overhead the way that they're meant to. You can do the same thing. You can set an alarm that'll go off and say, practice bringing your arms overhead, or whenever you go to reach something, reach for something high, right? So which oftentimes happens when we're pulling dishes out of cabinets or food or something, anything out of cabinets, right? You can pause, you can reach up, you can grab the cabinet handle, and you can open it mindfully, you can grab what you need, feeling those lat muscles and keeping the shoulders down mindfully, bringing it down mindfully. We can begin to practice moving our bodies better because when we move our bodies better, we feel better in our bodies, right? Okay, so keep thinking about that. If you're having struggles with putting your arms overhead pain-free, if you're having tightness in your neck, tightness in your traps, et cetera, that's a really fantastic way for you to start practicing that movement. And it starts with building that awareness. Ouch, I'm doing it wrong. Okay, okay, that's where my shoulders are supposed to be. Okay, I'm practicing this movement, I got it right, and the more repetitions we get of doing movements the correct way, the more likely those become habits, behaviors that we don't have to think about doing anymore, okay? So consistency is the key, and at first it might feel like you're pushing a rock up a hill, but it won't feel that way forever. The more consistent you are, the easier it will become. Eventually, it'll become second nature. It'll become the way that you actually move your body. Okay, I feel like we've hammered shoulders to bits on pain. <laughs> We've already been going for almost an hour, you guys. That's pretty incredible. We got a lot more stuff to talk about on pain. We got a lot more stuff to talk about on strength as well. So let's talk about this. Here we go. Um, so, uh, Kami, I saw the question about a mechanic. I think a lot of those thoracic stretches and the shoulder drills are going to help you as well. Um, we'll get back to yours, Kathleen, Kathleen, when we get to the legs and stuff. All right. So, we have another Roxana question here. Um, so Roxana shared a pretty crazy story here. I'm not going to go into crazy detail, but she almost suffered a, a fatal car accident, which is pretty crazy. And um, right now when she walks, her foot turns externally, right? And it's difficult because she has to think consistently to be able to get the foot to go back into alignment, right? And so she's asking me, how do I start to, to do things to make my body work properly and relearn the right ways of movement? So I'm going to focus on this one about the gait, about the walk. Okay, so we've already talked about activating the foot arch. And that's one of the most important things you can do when it comes to getting that foot to go from that pronation to being forward. Oftentimes when people have that walk, that duck walk where their feet are out like this, what you'll notice is they have a flat foot. And if I say bring an arch in, what happens is this, look. The arch comes into place and the foot generally straightens out a lot. So practicing the arch drill is gonna be something that's really important. And the progression for that is, after we learn how to practice the arch drill, can we then stand on one foot with good balance for 60 seconds? This is one of my favorite benchmarks for whether or not someone can move their body well. So here's a simple way to do this, right? One, put your finger in your belly button and one finger on your nose, activate your arch the way that I already showed you, and then bring your body over the foot, lift the knee up of the opposite foot, and see if you can hold that position for 60 seconds where it goes foot, belly button, nose, all right? Now, why I'm mentioning this is this. A lot of times when people go to balance on one leg, they'll go to balance on one leg and they'll do this. And by putting your finger in, on your belly button and your nose, you're gonna immediately know. You're gonna be like, oh my God, I'm so crooked. This is going to cause a lot of pain. And so what does this do? If I'm, if I'm standing here and I lift my leg to the outside, I'm gonna internally rotate and put my hip up like this. 
This is the same thing as me being here like this. So I'm putting my knee in a, in a bad position. My foot's not active. My external hip rotators are not active. It means I could cause lower back pain. It's just not a good position to be in. So by practicing the ability to shift our weight over to that one foot with an active arch and having that belly button, nose over toes, right? And find that balance and hold that balanced position. That's one of the best drills we can do to start practicing what it means for good movement. Because the more familiar you are with how this feels, how it feels to move your center of gravity over one foot with the knee lifted, right? You can see what I'm doing here. I'm walking, I'm running, I'm showing you the good movement that we're trying to learn. The more comfortable and familiar you are with this movement, the easier it will be for you to transfer this to walking, to running, you know, things like that, okay? So now I said a lot of stuff, but at first I know a lot of people can't do that. All right, so I'm gonna show you my simple method here is just get a chair or a wall and you're gonna shift your weight to that one foot and you're gonna put five fingers on a chair or a wall, right? You can do the five fingers on the wall like this and you're gonna start by trying to hold that for 60 seconds. Once you're able to do this for, let's call it a week, with all five fingers, then all you're gonna do is lift your thumb. Once you're able to do that for a week, then you're gonna lift your pinky, then you're gonna lift your ring, then you're gonna lift your middle finger, then finally you're gonna lift your index finger and that's gonna slowly give you a system to building that balance over time. And the fastest you can get through that progression is six weeks. So you can see what I mean when I'm saying, take your time, move slow, build a strong foundation because a strong foundation allows you to keep going. Trying to do too much on a weak foundation is that one step forward, one step back that we get trapped in and we never make any progress, okay? So learning how to balance on that one foot is absolutely critical. Now, another recommendation I like to give to our WeShape members is anchor a new habit to an old habit. And so ideally, you already brush your teeth for two minutes a day, right? That's what I hope everybody on this call is doing to take care of those pearly whites, all right? And if you do, what you can do is set a timer for two minutes and practice while you're brushing your teeth that balance on one foot. That's gonna make it a little harder because you're gonna be doing something else with the opposite hand, but that's good for the brain to learn how to do multiple things at the same time. and then one minute on the opposite leg. Now, if you do this every night while you're brushing your teeth, you're gonna slowly build that ability to find your balance and being able to stand on one foot independently and shift your weight to that foot without shifting your whole body over and losing your core, losing your midline, causing lots of pain in the rest of the body, okay? So that's the first step, I think, towards anybody who's having pain in walking, they feel like their body's not in alignment while walking, is just learning how to bring their whole center of uh, mass and gravity over one foot with vertical alignment with an active arch, okay? And what you should feel is you should feel these muscles in the butt and the outsides of the hip. These are the ones that are gonna be stabilizing you during this motion, all right? You're gonna feel those hip external rotators, the glutes, et cetera. That's gonna be really helpful to, to notice, oh wow, these muscles are starting to burn. That usually means you're doing it right, okay? As long as there's not pain in the knees and other areas of the body. Now, how do we transfer this drill to walking with good form? Well. If we practice this every day and build awareness of around how this feels to stand on one foot, it's gonna be easier just to start walking and being mindful around what it means to walk with good form. But if you wanna start practicing this in more of a walking capacity, what we can do is this. <laughs> we can put one hand on the belly button, one hand on the nose. We can stand nice and tall and we can just take a step, right? So we'll just go, I'm balancing on one foot. I'm transferring my weight to the foot. I'm leaning forward and I'm lifting the other foot. And I'm just gonna slowly but surely walk forward with my belly button and nose over each other. And you can take steps backwards too if you want to, right? But practicing this motion, right? One of the things that, um, it's funny, I was actually talking to my dad about this the other day. He was talking about how he's trying to walk a lot more. And um, oftentimes when people want to gain fitness or become fit or do exercise, they think like walking, I gotta go walk because walking is so good for you, right? And I love walking, I think it's fantastic for you. But the truth is any movement can be done wrong. And if you do that movement wrong, you increase your risk of aches, pains, and injuries. So if I go out and walk wrong, and I go out and walk wrong more, all I'm gonna do is hurt myself more faster, even though I think I might be trying to help myself. So if we're out there and we're walking, we're hitting the pavement every day, and we're like, wow, this hurts a lot. Slow down. Stop the two mile walks every day and start doing the 200 foot super slow walks. 
try and repattern that movement. I know it doesn't feel fun. I know it feels slow. I know it feels boring. But sometimes we have to do the boring things to build the strong foundation so that we can actually go out and move our bodies in the way that they're meant to move freely for as long as possible. And I would much rather have you spend you know, six weeks, six months learning how to walk consistently, right? With the body aligned over the feet and then transfer that to being able to go a lot faster than to be able to uh, try and walk three miles at a time and end up with aches, pains, and injuries in your knees, your hips, et cetera, okay? Okay, hopefully that helps a lot with, uh, with you, Roxana. I'm so sorry for you know, the almost fatal car accident, but you're clearly a fighter, so keep fighting and be patient with yourself, all right? Okay. Uh, okay, we got a lot of muscle spasm ones, I think, coming up here. Let me see. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, I'm going to get the muscle spasm one in a second, Cynthia. I'm going to come right back to you because I got a couple recommendations for that. <clears throat> okay, so Audrey, I have tendinopathy in the form uh, of a lump on one of my Achilles tendons for about six months. I've been doing stretches and exercises to settle it down as well as massaging it, but it hasn't really shrunk or gone away. Any ideas to help uh, prevent recurrence? Okay, so whew, sometimes I got to be the guy who gives the bad news, all right? So here's the deal. When we have tendinosis, tendinitis, or in this particular instance, um, tendinopathy, which is going to be like inflammation in a specific spot where there's likely some tearing or some balling of the tissue. Um, we think that the move is strengthen it or create more flexibility. But you can kind of imagine this would be like if you have a rubber band in the sunshine and it was old and it was like cracking and we're like, let's stretch it more and that'll make it better, right? That's not going to happen. It's probably just going to make it worse and it's going to make it weaker and eventually it's going to get really hurt. So one of the hardest parts about tendon specific injuries is we have to rest those areas of the body. Now, probably the best way for me to share this is a, a personal story. Um, I was doing a lot of exercises that involved kind of hand strength and moving through the wrists. At the same time, I was doing a construction job. This is a long time ago, but I was swinging a hammer like this. And at the same time, I was playing drums in a rock band where I was doing this motion over and over again. So constantly, I was doing this motion with my wrist, okay? And you know what happened? I started getting tendinosis in my wrist. And I was like, you know what? I'll just work through it. I'll just, it'll get stronger, blah, 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 blah. It got worse, it got worse, it got worse. It became tendinosis, right? Which is basically chronic inflammation of the joint, uh, or of the tendon, rather. And the only thing that changed it for me was putting my wrist in a wrist brace and not letting me go through that lateral range of motion. I, I believe it was for about three or four weeks. And then I slowly, gradually got back into my activities, and that was what fixed it all. And so I know this is challenging because this is your ankle joint, but I think that something that might be worth trying is either seeing a PT, a physical therapist, or a, 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 a doctor who's a specialist in this joint, and seeing maybe wearing some sort of ankle brace or ankle boot that keeps the ankle fairly frozen, that's not stretching the tendon over again, for a short period of time to see if that's, that causes a reduction in inflammation in that tendon so that hopefully it calms down and you can get back to your daily life right? The hardest part about this being in the Achilles tendon is that it means that you should probably try to not do a lot of things on your feet for a short period of time. Again, two, three, four weeks. But again, it's worth it. You've said you've had this for six months. It's worth it to try something different for a few weeks in hopes that it'll calm the inflammation down enough that you can start building your work capacity up. Just remember, don't do it for three weeks. Take the ankle uh, you know, brace off and then start jumping rope and running up and down stairs, okay? Because you're going to be right back in the same position. Go slow, build that strength slowly. But sometimes by stretching it, by trying to strengthen it, we just irritate it more and it never gets a chance to heal. How do we actually heal? Rest, 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 rest. Okay, all right. Okay, Christine, we're gonna talk about forearm, stretching the forearm from tennis elbow injury. So if you guys are watching right now and jumped in, let me give you like a lay of the land of what we're doing. We're gonna talk about <laughs> forearms. Then we're gonna talk about scoliosis, a little bit more on the upper back. Um, and then we're going to talk about SI joint, and we're going to do a big old section of SI joint and lower back. This seems to be the most common thing that people are having issues with consistently, SI joint and lower back. So we're going to do forearms, um, a little bit of scoliosis, upper back, and then we're going to talk about SI joint, lower back, and, and teach you a lot of moves there. All right? So Christine, stretching forearm from tennis elbow injury, okay? So tennis elbow oftentimes um, isn't necessarily related to a lack of flexibility, but it's related to a lack of balance between the external rotators of the forearm and the internal rotator of the forearm. That being said, I will show you stretches to see if they work for you. Try them out. If it feels better consistently afterwards, keep doing them. 
If it feels worse, obviously don't do them, right? Remember, you guys are all your own experiment. You need to advocate for yourselves. You need to listen to your bodies. You need to try things, but don't let someone else be your guru. Our goal at WeShape isn't to be your guru. It's to help you learn to be your own guru, okay? So to stretch the wrist and forearm, here are some of my favorite ones, especially as it relates to the rotation of the wrist and forearm, right? So what you're gonna do is this. Arm goes out, palm towards the ground. You're going to bend your palm down like this. You're gonna spin your shoulder in, and I'm gonna grab the top of my hand this direction. So I'm reaching over to grab my hand, and I'm gonna pull the hand towards the forearm and towards the side like this. And you're gonna feel a spiral stretch coming through the top of the forearm and down into the elbow. So it's gonna come through the top of the forearm, down into the elbow. So I'm going like this, almost like you're clasping hands and you're rotating inward like this. That's another way to do it, or putting your hands on the top of the hands and rotating inward like this. You can hold that stretch for around 30 seconds. The forearms don't need necessarily as much time as the lower body, at least in my experience. Um, and then what you're gonna do is flip it around. This time, palm towards the sky. You're going to bring your palm towards your wrist and you're gonna see if you can grab your thumb right here and rotate your wrist inward like that. Rotate the wrist inward like that. And this time you're gonna feel a stretch down the inside of the forearm like that. And you can play around with this. You can do it with the palm facing towards you or you can do it with the palm facing away from you like this. One of those is gonna be more of a stretch for you going this way or going this way, right? So again, we're gonna do one stretch like this or like this, clasping the hands and one stretch, either grabbing the thumb like this or grabbing the hand and rotating out like this. And that's gonna give you the stretch in the forearms and the wrist that might relieve some tension in the tennis elbow. And that being said, I wanna show you a drill that I recommend for people often with tennis elbow, which is strengthening those wrist external and internal rotators. So palm towards the ground, make a fist. We're gonna take our hand and we're gonna place it over our fist like this. And you're going to turn this palm toward the sky and you're gonna resist that turn with this hand. This hand is gonna provide the resistance. So you're providing resistance with the hand on the top you're gonna rotate your hand up and then relax, start over. Grab the hand, rotate, and you should feel the muscles on the outside of the forearm working right here as you go through this movement. You wanna do this for about 10 to 20 repetitions or 60 to 90 seconds if time works better for you. And ideally you're getting a nice pump in that forearm. Now you're gonna go the opposite direction, palm towards the sky, hand on the top, and this time you're gonna rotate your palm down and you're gonna resist with that arm. So rotate the palm down as much as you can, Resist the arm. You're gonna feel the opposite muscles working that rotate the hand. Usually one of these is gonna feel stronger significantly and one of them is gonna feel weaker. We want them to be fairly balanced though, which is oftentimes the issue behind um, having tennis elbow in the first place. Try practicing this particular movement, not every day. I'd say this one two to three days per week for one to two sets. So one set, 60, 90 seconds, one set the other way, 60, 90 seconds and repeat that maybe one more time if you don't feel like you've got adequate strength inside the forearm. Try this two to three days a week for two to three weeks and see if that strengthens that internal and external rotation of the elbow, which can help with your tennis elbow symptoms, okay? And you can try those stretches too, see if they work for you. But again, listen to your body. Everything I'm gonna say right now is just recommendations to try. And your job is to listen to your body. All right, let's talk about scoliosis here. <clears throat> Okay, if you guys are not aware, scoliosis is an issue with the upper back where the spine curves to the side and then curves back up. Now, some people think that scoliosis is congenital, means that we inherit it. Um, that's true in some cases. For some people, we end up injuring our right foot and we transfer our weight to our left foot more and all of a sudden we have to compensate through a curvature in our spine and we start to develop a scoliosis later in life. Now, here's the thing I've come to discover. Almost nobody has a straight spine, okay? If I were to x-ray everybody who's watching this live call, which I'm sure is thousands of people by now, I would have thousands of different x-rays and thousands of different spines, okay? And having a bend in your spine doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have aches, pains, or injuries, or that you're gonna have issues with your spine, okay? One of the things that's really hard for people to learn is that if I do these x-rays or I take an MRI of a bunch of people's spines, you'll have people who have scoliosis, who have disc bulges, who move well, and who don't have any pain. And you're gonna have people who have no scoliosis or minor, no disc bulges, and they have horrible pain, right? And you'll also find the opposite situations of both are true. And so it's really challenging sometimes to say that this equals this. That being said, scoliosis can be a challenge, especially when it comes to that upper back mobility that allows you to move the shoulders and have better posture more freely. 
So I'm gonna revert back to those stretches that I showed you in the beginning. Just remember real quick, it's the rotational stretch, right? So opening the chest and rotating like this. This is a fantastic stretch for the upper back. It is the arms behind the back, lifting the chest like this. It is the sink stretch where we're grabbing onto the sink and we're dropping our tailbone and we're opening the shoulders. It's the chest stretch. All of those movements are gonna be fantastic for scoliosis. But beyond that, one movement I want you to set into your daily routine every day is a simple spine rotation. Some people call it a Tai Chi waist turn, okay? So I'm gonna stand up to show you this movement because this is my favorite way to do it. But start with your feet straight forward, right underneath your hips. Nice tall posture. <clears throat> all you're gonna do is this. Relax your arms, relax your shoulders. And all you're gonna do is just leave with your eyes and just turn a little bit to the side, a little bit to the other side, and just let the arms kind of dangle and just kind of swing. We wanna let the arms just really relax in this position, okay? And you're gonna come back and forth like this. And each time you're gonna try to get a little bit more range of motion. And you're not trying to get the range of motion out of this lower back region, right? We're trying to get the range of the motion by leaving with the eyes so that we're getting that rotation of the spine, rotation of the upper back, rotation of the upper back, okay? Again, just letting the arms hang down. If you get up out of bed every morning and you do this for one minute, it is going to make the spine feel so much better. And for those of you who have scoliosis and it feels like your spine is constantly stuck in a position, this probably won't fix it, but it's probably gonna be something fantastic that you can insert in your routine along with some of the other stretches that I showed you for the upper back and the shoulder girdle that is gonna make your upper back feel significantly better. In fact, it's feeling so good right now, I don't wanna stop. Maybe we should just do this for the next two hours, right? And call it a day. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I'm just playing with you guys. So, um, but at the end of the day, that simple waist turn, that Tai Chi waist turn, that spine twist, one of my favorite all-time mobility drills that most people can do. Um, one quick segment here is your knees. If your knees hurt while you're doing it, just wanna real quick recalibrate here. If your knees hurt, feel free to come up on your toe and rotate like this, okay? So if you have to, and you wanna come up and rotate on the toe like this, that's totally fine, and then rotate on the toe like this. Oftentimes, if people keep their knees stationary, it puts that, that inward pressure on the knee, and it can cause some pain, okay? So let's take a look at what we got next. We got uh, scoliosis and Lynn. I saw your question here. So that was Denise and Lynn and uh, Linda as well. Actually, I'm gonna give you one stretch, Linda. So Denise and Lynn, a lot of those stretches for the shoulder girdle, for the posture is gonna really help out with the upper back as well. So try those out. I really hope those moves are gonna help you. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna do one more question from Linda and then we're gonna go lower back SI joint. We're gonna blaze through like 10 questions and a lot of different remedies for lower back and SI joint. So if you have lower back pain, SI joint pain, this is gonna definitely be for you. Um, Linda, so how do I relieve pain in the upper back uh, between the shoulder blades that also causes pain in my neck and shoulders? Sometimes I wake up in the morning with numbness in my hands. So we talked a lot about how the nerves innervate here and they can often be related to the hands. I showed you those upper back stretches, but I'm gonna show you my favorite stretch for the traps and the neck that I think is really awesome for people to do when it comes to stretching that up, upper thoracic and um, cervical vertebrae right here and also giving more space and length in these muscles around the neck and around the shoulders that can often cause a lot of pain. Remember, those are the muscles that we try to lift our arms overhead with all the time, right? So first of all, stop doing that, stop overusing those muscles and then add this stretch to the mix. It should really help the neck and the shoulders, okay? <laughs> so it's ideal to do this in a chair where you have something where you can grab the bottom of the chair with your hand, all right? If we can anchor our hand down here, it's gonna be really important to get this stretch done properly. So grab the bottom of the chair with your hand like this and don't let it move. Now from there, you're gonna think about tall. Don't just lean to the side. The biggest mistake people make when stretching their neck and their upper back is this. They go to lean to the side and watch this, they cave. You see how my whole body just kind of caves? My rib drops down to my hip, my whole body caves like this. All I'm doing is bending to the side and allowing my spine to push down. Now there's a lot of muscles in between each one of these vertebrae right here in the spine that are called the multifidus. And each one of these muscles lift the subsequent vertebrae up. And so that's the difference between this and this, right? Is our ability to use those muscles to increase the length of our spine. So hand goes under the hip, we increase the length of our spine, we don't collapse our body sideways, we reach our face toward the sky. So I'm reaching the side of my cheek towards the sky. Now immediately we should feel a stretch from right behind the ear at the base of the ear, all the way down into the neck. Oftentimes, sometimes people feel it through the chest, through the top of the traps, even into the shoulder, sometimes the bicep and the forearm. So it can go all the way down the arm right here. So keep lifting and hold this position. Now I'm gonna show you a technique to deepen the stretch. Only do this if it feels comfortable. So listen to your body. You're gonna take your hand, you're gonna put it on the top of your head like this, and you're gently gonna pull your head down, not hard at all, and maintaining that length in the spine. 
Now what you're gonna do is push against that hand with your head, right? So pushing against that hand with your head just a little bit, building a little bit of tension in the neck of the traps. Hold for about 10 seconds, and then I want you to take a big breath in. And as you exhale, relax the neck pressure and let the hand just pull the neck to the side. This is a great movement that can oftentimes increase the flexibility in your neck significantly by just doing a few of these relaxed contract movements, okay? So one more time, push your hand against, your head against your hand, build a little bit of tension, big breath in, exhale, let the neck come down to the side. Oh, I even got a nice little crack in that one. That felt good, a little extra space. Awesome. Wow, that feels so good, you guys. Now, one thing, if you followed along with the stretch, pause for a second. How do you feel on the side that you stretched versus the side that you didn't stretch? It probably feels completely different, right? Like, wow, my neck and my shoulder feel like 10 years younger on this side, and this side feels tight still. So let's do the other side, and remember, that's the feeling we wanna chase. Wow, I feel good after I do that. Because we've built this relationship with exercise that says exercise means fear and insecurity and bad and negative, right? Instead of exercise and movement and stretches means feeling good, feeling happy, feeling like my body feels good so I can do the things I wanna be able to do with my body for as long as possible. So remember that, right? <clears throat> Grab the bottom side of the chair with your opposite hand, tall posture again and let's bring the face toward the sky. Remember, we're not leaning to the side, we're bringing the face toward the sky. And let your body just lean to the side. And if you like bringing your hand on top, we'll do that one more time here for two repetitions. So slowly building tension, pushing your hand or your head against your hand, still remaining, maintaining that length. Big breath in. And let it all go. You might find yourself getting a lot more flexibility as you do this. Now, once you get to that new position, just try to relax. Reassess, are you long as you can get? Get as long as possible. Now start building tension one more time, pushing the neck against the hand, slowly building a little more tension, a little more, and then a big breath in, and let it all go. Let the head come down to the side. Length, length, length. Ooh, all the way down into the shoulder. Ah, and slowly come out of it. Ah, now I've got a neck and shoulder girl that feels good, right? We can do a couple of these rolls should feel excellent, okay? So this is one of my favorite stretches for just the neck, the upper back. If you have tightness in your neck and your upper back, it's so critical for you. Please do this stretch. Again, you can use that technique I shared earlier. Set a reminder in your phone on your alarms to go off once a day, twice a day maybe, and just say next stretch, right? And just remember to do this next stretch. You can do this at work while sitting in a chair. You can do it while watching TV. So a lot of these movements are so simple that people don't even do them because they think they're too simple. But if you have tight neck and traps and you do this consistently for the next like week, once a day, your neck and your traps will loosen and your body will feel better. And my hope is that that better feeling in your body is gonna make you wanna do these stretches more. So you see that upward spiral? We feel good, we wanna do it more. We feel bad, we wanna run away from it. You see where exercise and fitness has taken us wrong? They've taken us wrong for decades now. So let's do it a different way, okay? All right, we're gonna talk about SI joint and lower back. I'm gonna take a sip of this tea real quick. Mm -mm -mm. All right, we are 70 minutes deep, you guys, but we're gonna go for another hour and a half on this live call. So I'm gonna keep going. Again, the goal is to find the movements that feel right for you. Don't pick 10 or 20 of them. Pick a few that you wanna do consistently, do them consistently, and watch how your body feels significantly better, all right? Now, before I get to SI Join and back, I just wanna remind you guys, this is Cyber Monday, and while we're doing this big Q&A for free and trying to help as many people as possible, we're also doing a sale where you can save 65% off any of our We Shape plans. Now, if you've been wondering about We Shape, you've been watching our content on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, Facebook for a while, you're like, what do these guys even do? Well, we spent the time to build a software that acts like having me as your very own personal trainer, all right? So what it does is it asks you a bunch of questions in the beginning, you tell it, hey, here's how flexible I am, here's the moves I can do with my hips, here's how like everything that we need to know about you in order to customize a program for you. Then it picks the right movements for you. Because one of the biggest problems with the follow along workouts that you get online is they just give you like a handful of workouts and say, choose which one you wanna do. Every movement in our workouts is designed for you. That's what our software does. It puts the right movement in front of you at the right time to achieve the goals that you have of feeling better in your body. And the best part is we've even built this to ask you for feedback during the workouts. And when you say, oh, that move was too hard or that move was just right or that move was too easy, we're gonna scale the difficulty up, down, or keep it the same. 
depending on your feedback during the workouts. This is the most flexible and personalized workout system that I've ever seen built online. And we are just getting started with the personalizations, right? WeShape is going to be the best online health and fitness program out there. That's what I consistently try to do is make it so that people can show up for these personalized workouts, for personalized movement snacks, et cetera, and help you feel better in your body. And as an extra side note, you're gonna get access to live Q&A calls with myself, with Dr. Lisa, and with our WeCare coaches as well, where you can jump on a Zoom call face-to-face -face where I can look you in the eyes and you can ask me questions about, you know, what do I need to do to, you know, change the way I'm doing this movement or to fix this aches, pain, and injury, to gain flexibility or strength here. We'll be able to give you recommendations one-on-one -on -one instead of one-to-many like we're doing in this live call. So if you want to get access to myself, Dr. Lisa, our, our team, if you want to get access to personalized at-home workouts that were designed just for you, then you can save 65% off any WeShape plan right now on Cyber Monday. So if you're on YouTube or Facebook, you can click the link above and below this right now or head on over to the link in our profile and click that link. You can also type in weshape.com backslash question and it'll take you straight to that page where you can save 65% off. And if you're on TikTok or Instagram, you can head on over to our main page in the bio and click that link right there. That'll take you to that page. One caveat though, this is Cyber Monday. It is Monday, November 27th, and right now it is 2.21 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which means that this sale is only going for, what is that? It's almost three o'clock, nine more hours. And then the sale is gone 65% off any plan, meaning if you sign up for one of our year plans right now, you can save hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and you can have workouts, coaching, free access to our feel-good challenges, access to our community for the entire rest of this year and almost the entire year of 2024, right? So I highly recommend if you don't have a consistent workout program and you want to be surrounded with a community and get direct access to coaches who can help you feel better in your body, then weshape.com backslash question. Click the link above or below in our profiles and check that out before midnight before you miss out, all right? Okay, let's go into some SI joint and, and uh, lower back questions, okay? So I've got, let's see here. I've got quite a few people. So I got Diane, I got Chantel. Um, let's see here. Okay, we'll get to the other questions there in, in a bit here. Diane and Chantel were specific to the SI joint, okay? <clears throat> a lot of times when people have SI joint and your lower back pain, I'm gonna present a simple concept to you, okay? I'll stand up to do this. Um, when we have pain in our lower back, there is one of two reasons we have pain in our lower back, okay? Reason number one is that we have this posture where our tailbone is tucked under and our upper back is forward like this, right? So this is the posture that a lot of people have. They walk around, they usually have not a lot of glute muscles, right? Maybe they have pain in their lower back. They definitely have a rounded upper back like this, okay? So this is an, a really common posture for number one. This is that, that um, you know, rounded back, hunched back posture. Then posture number two is this posture right here, which is, I like to call it the Donald Duck posture, where our butt sticks out like this and our hip flexors are really short. And that's gonna put pressure on the lower back as well. So both of these things can cause a lot of aches, pains, and injuries in the lower back. So we have to correct both of these issues. For a lot of people with SI joint pain, it's probably gonna be this one, which is called an anterior pelvic tilt. So if you have tight hip flexors, meaning if you come into this lunge position right here and you feel tightness through the hip flexor, then 100% you probably have anterior pelvic tilt and your SI joint pain is probably coming from that anterior pelvic tilt, which I'm gonna show you how to fix that in a second. If you don't have that anterior pelvic tilt and you more have this type of posture, it could be because your weight is in front of your spine, which is pulling on the spine, which is causing that inflammation and aches and pains in the SI joint. So this right here, if we take a good look, is the SI joint. It's the sacroiliac joint. So this is where the lower back, the lumbar spine and the tailbone meet the hips, okay? And what we want to minimize the inflammation in this joint is we wanna minimize the movement in this hip, okay? And so a lot of times people will move a lot through the lower back, putting a lot of pressure through these joints. When these joints get inflamed, one of our biggest nerves goes through the SI joint and down into the hips and can cause pain in our hips, in our knees, in our feet, and radiating pain in our lower back, okay? So let's take a few steps to go through this. I wanna talk about the SI joint. I wanna talk about immediate relief first, okay? So if you have SI joint pain, probably the first thing you can do for immediate relief is to decompress your SI joint. My favorite way to do this is to take a chair, is to put that chair like this, is to lay down on the floor, on your back like this, <coughs> and to grab a pillow, I don't have a pillow right next to me, so I'm gonna grab a foam roller, and put it underneath your knees like this, 
okay? We got a pillow right here just in case I need it. I'll use that just so you guys can match me at home, all right? So what you want is whatever is behind your knees being just tall enough that it feels like it's pulling your leg this direction out of your socket, okay? So it should feel like your hips have the ability to settle towards the ground a little bit. Now from there, I want you to create length in your spine so you can wiggle your knees like this. You can create length and walk your shoulder blades up. So from the tailbone to the top of your head is as much length as possible. Bring the shoulders away from the ears. And then in this position, I want you to breathe deep into the pelvis. You can even use your hands down here for support if you need to figure out how to breathe deep into the pelvis. Don't breathe into the chest. Deep into the belly. And then just try to find the areas of tension and relax the areas of tension. Now, in this position, if you really want to decompress the hip capsule and decompress the SI joint, you can sit here for 30 minutes. You can sit here reading a book. You can scroll on your phone, your iPad or whatever. You can watch TV, whatever you can do in this position. But this is a great way if you have immediate SI joint pain, meaning like you went to pick something up, ah, it stabbed you in the lower back. You need immediate relief. Spending some time on your back with some traction in the hip can be really, really useful for you. Now, here's the reason why, all right? I mentioned a few seconds ago that when we have pain in our lower back, it can often be related to our hip having extra movement right here. When our hip capsule is really tight, meaning if I go like this, my hip is jammed into the socket. You can barely see it, but you can see the hip jammed in the socket like this, and it's really tight inside there. Well, then guess what? If I go to lift my leg forward, it's gonna pull on the pelvis. So I'm standing in the air like this, right? And I go to lift my, my leg up, and instead of lifting my leg up like this, I let my pelvis pull down with the leg because my hip joint is tight. And every single time I do this movement right here, if I'm walking, whatever it is, I'm creating movement inside this SI joint that's not supposed to happen. And so when we do traction drill, instead of our hip being in the socket like this, our hip comes out of the socket now like this. And that space inside the hip capsule allows you to freely move the leg without pulling on the pelvis and the SI joint. So instead of going like this when you take a step, you go like this and your whole body stays in one position from your pelvis all the way to your top, top of your head, okay? So <clears throat> really important that we decompress the hip capsule. This is my favorite beginner way to decompress the hip capsule if you're having SI joint pain. One of my other favorite ways to decompress the hip capsule is to just rest in a squat position. So I'm gonna show you two different ways to rest in a squat position to decompress the hip capsule. The first being a little bit more beginner and the second being a little bit more advanced, okay? This is one of the most important movements that most people should do to not only restore that length and space inside the hip capsule, but also to restore function of the knees, function of the hips, and even function of the ankles, all right? So in bed and in a position where you're very comfortable, <laughs> come down to your knees like this and come down to your elbows like this. Again, ideally you should be doing this in bed so when you're kneeling, it's super soft, right? And you can play around with the distance between your knees. The wider your knees go, the harder this will be. The more narrow they go, the easier it'll be, all right? And from there, what we're gonna do is this. We're just gonna drop the heels back towards our butt and let the knees come out to the outside. We're trying to create space in the hips. We're trying to create length in the lower back. So right here, I don't want you to like cramp up and do this kind of thing, right? Think about somebody's pulling on your tailbone and you're pushing your arms up like this just to try and drive the hips more towards your heels. Right here, find the tight positions and go. Just like with all stretches, and relax the hips down, relax the hips down. Now, if you're able to get past a 90 degree position here, or maybe even a little further, maybe like 135 degrees right here, if you're able to get down to this position, then what we can do is we can start working on resting in the bottom of a squat. And I know a lot of you are probably like, never gonna happen, I won't be able to do that for the rest of my life, but I promise you, any of these movements done consistently can reshape the way that your body works, in terms of strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination if you do it consistently, all right? So first drill, decompression on your back that I showed you. Second, facing the ground and dropping the hips almost like in a child's pose position. Third drill is gonna be coming to the edge of a chair. If you're worried about any sort of support, you can also put pillows on the ground that you can sit on below you to create that space that you need. But coming down into a squat position like this and trying to work the knees open, the knees in front of the toes with the heels flat, working the hips open right here. And again, you might start up here and only be able to hold for a few seconds and then come back up, that's totally fine. 
again, having something underneath you, like a, like a low ottoman or a stack of pillows, that's totally fine too. But just coming into this squat position can be so useful to open the hips up, which can create space in the hips and the lower back in a way that's gonna traction the hips the same way I just showed you in the chair. So this is more of a preemptive drill that you can do for better um, flexibility and strength in the knees and the hips, okay? Now in this position, what you wanna do is slowly work your way down so you're able to start relaxing. And then you're gonna to wanna to take one arm off the chair, push it into your knee, take the other arm off the chair, push it in your knee and open the hips. And then from there, spending time in the bottom of a squat where the knees are going the same direction as the toes, right? And where our feet are flat on the ground is one of the best things you can do for your hips, for your lower back, for your knees. And again, remember, I'm not telling you that if you can't squat at all right now, um, you should just drop down to this position in the next six weeks. What I'm suggesting is you can do some of these movement snacks and you can follow along to our We Shape workouts or some of the free workouts that we post on our social media. And you can do those consistently. And over the course of two or three years, you will regain the strength and flexibility to be able to do things like this again, if you're consistent, okay? So remember, this is not the path of six weeks, this is the path of six months or several years. But if I told you right now, if you did small steps consistently for the next two or three years, that you would gain twice as much flexibility and twice as much strength and have more movement freedom in your daily life, you'd probably be like, sign me up, right? In fact, if I could put you in your body it, and show you how it felt if you had done that consistently for two years, you'd be like, sign me up, right? So start with these baby steps and do these movements and over time continuously make that progress so you can gain that flexibility and strength inside your body that allows you to loosen things up. So for the SI joint, again, doing those two things is really important. Now, if you have that rounded upper back, right? Like this, this is, the move, this is like the posture that we see a lot of the time that rounded upper back, right, where the, where the upper back's like this, that usually means that we have tight hamstrings. What you'll notice is someone like that will go to bend forward, and they're like this, uh, 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 I can't touch my toes, right? If this is you, then we have to loosen up the hamstrings, okay? And that's gonna help get the pelvis back into the right position, which is gonna remove the likelihood of us injuring our SI joint or our lower back, okay? So I'm gonna show you my favorite stretch. You guys have probably seen me do this a thousand times before, but if you haven't, <clears throat> The basics are the key, and this is one of my favorites. So if you have tight hamstrings, put a towel next to your bed or a belt or anything like that you can use. Take that towel before you get out of bed and before you go to bed. Put it over the ball of your foot. Don't put it over the arch of the foot. Put it over the ball of the foot. Now, extend the bottom leg and use this towel to pull your toes towards your nose until you feel a nice tight hamstring and calf muscle. And in that position, just hold for a second. Breathe in. Exhale and relax as you let your leg come up. And breathe in, and exhale, and relax as you let your leg come up. And it doesn't matter if you're way down here, that's totally fine, or if you're way up here, that's totally fine too. What we wanna measure is this. Over time, again, not six weeks, but six months or longer, can we get to the point where we can bring our hand to our feet, okay? With our lower back on the ground. That's, that's the goal we wanna have for the amount of hamstring flexibility we wanna have to know that we can do the things that we wanna do in our daily life, right? And make sure you do the other side. This is great for lower back and for people, especially with that rounded upper back posture, because typically we're the ones with the tight, tight hamstrings. So we wanna be able to go and loosen those muscles up. Now, one thing about the hamstrings, you guys, a lot of these hip muscles, the lower body muscles, um, we hold a lot of tension in them because our body doesn't trust that we can go into these positions. So a really helpful visual as you're holding something like a hamstring stretch or a hip flexor stretch or a squat stretch is just to, Get your mind inside the muscle. So if it's the hamstrings or the hips, wherever, and just try to feel where there's tension. And you'll feel tension. You'll feel the muscle holding on. Like, no, I'm not gonna go there. Find that muscle and just tell that muscle, it's okay to relax, okay? Big breath in. <sighs> it's okay to relax. You're safe, right? And the more safety we create in our bodies, the more flexibility we have in our bodies. And the more flexibility along with strength we have in our bodies, the better, the easier it is to move our bodies freely, okay? So this is a fantastic stretch for people who have that rounded upper back posture. If that's not you, and you have this anterior pelvic tilt that we talked about where the butt sticks out like this, then it's likely the hip flexors. So I'm gonna show you two different variations of a stretch for the hip flexors. Number one is just coming into a lunge position, bringing your hips forward like this, 
and then imagining your pelvis squeezing your glutes and pointing your tailbone towards the ground. A lot of people, when they do this stretch, they'll stick their butt out like this, right? And then when they stick your butt out like this, you're staying in that anterior pelvic tilt. It's not actually helping you. Instead of sticking your butt out, tilt your butt under like this so that your pelvis is upright and your spine is upright, and then allow your body to drop forward towards that front heel while maintaining that pelvic position, right? So again, not sticking the butt out like this. I'll move my hands, sticking the butt out like this. Instead, tuck the pelvis and then bring the body forward like this, right? Inhale, exhale, and you should feel a deep stretch coming through the front side of the leg. And you don't even have to take that big of a step. It could be this far for you if you feel like a nice stretch through there. And you can use chairs on either side for support if you need to have chairs on either side for support. It's really important that we don't worry about the balance when we're trying to create flexibility. Now, if this doesn't feel like a good enough stretch for you, you could take a, a pillow, <clears throat> put it down on the ground, kneel on that pillow. You could turn your hips forward, same way we were just talking about. Tuck the pelvis, so don't let the butt stick out. Tuck the pelvis and then drop the hips towards that front heel. And this is one of my favorite all-time hip flexor stretches. Again, breathing in to the belly, exhaling, trying to create length between the knees. So length between the knees, trying to point that tailbone towards the ground as much as possible, not try to compensate through the lower back like this, and instead pointing that tailbone down and really getting that deep hip flexor stretch, right? And you can do this one for 30 to 60 seconds each side. I'm gonna switch to the other side real quick so I can get a nice little hip flexor stretch. And again, Focus on the pelvis position. So tilting the pelvis under like this and then coming forward while squeezing those glutes subtly. That's gonna protect the lower back. It's gonna target the hip flexor more. Ah, and this is a great one because gravity will really just do the stretch for you. If we just relax the front hip, we relax the back hip, gravity is gonna do that stretch for you, right? Now when we create length inside the hip flexors, what happens? If I have length inside the hip flexors, I go from tight, right, right here, where I don't have any good posture, to all of a sudden, I got length in the hip flexors, then our pelvis comes into the right spot, okay? So tight hip flexors are like this, length in hip flexors is like this, okay? And so that will help us if we have that posture, that anterior pelvic tilt, consistently stretching the hip flexor muscles, okay? Um, let's talk about the lower back more. So I'm gonna just bring in uh, questions from a lot of people. So I'm gonna say the names here so you guys know I'm addressing you right here. So Denise B, um, you've had back pain, you know, trying to fix, fix it with exercise and not surgery. <clears throat> tried physical therapy, chiropractors, uh, injections, MRIs, you name it. I hope I can present a concept to you that'll be useful. Randy, lower back pain, needs relief. Thomas, stenosis in the lower back. So that's gonna be inflammation, more in these like lumbar vertebrae right here where they're kind of discs are compressed, right? Um, and I think that decompression on the SI joint should be helpful to you as well, but we'll try to make sure you have uh, everything you need there. Um, let's see, Kimberly um, is talking about her mom and doing uh, extension exercise through the lower back. And how can we do that without leaning on our belly? So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Sarah has herniated discs and wants to know if she should be doing other things than the elevator. How does she stabilize her core during her workouts? Hillary had questions about the lower back. Uh, Tamara had some issues with bulging discs in the lower back, preventing her from doing exercises. A chiropractor is helpful, but then it goes back to square one um, until the next time they visit. That's good news, by the way. Um, Nadia, um, talking about spinal stenosis, L4, L5, disc problems, et cetera, okay? So uh, a lot of this, as you can see, is just lower back, 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 okay? So I wanna talk about a concept here because it's really important, um, and I think it's a big reason why people end up hurting their lower backs. I wanna talk about the concept uh, of how to properly activate your core, and then I want to teach you how to do it, and then I wanna teach you how to do it while bending forward to pick something up. Because the number one way that people injure their lower back is they go to bend over to pick something up and they do it wrong with an inactive core and they end up hurting themselves. But what you gotta do for me before we jump into this is you got to take any concept you know about how to activate your core and strengthen your core and you need to throw it in the trash right now because you've probably been told that sucking your belly button towards your spine is the best way to activate your core or doing crunches and sit-ups is the best way to strengthen your core things like this, okay? And unfortunately, these things aren't true and they actually could be causing more back pain than helping that back pain, all right? And if I have people on there who disagree with me, by all means, please spend some time on Google looking up the difference between um, bracing versus drawing in and you will find many, many articles uh, that are peer-reviewed research studies talking about how bracing or the movement I'm gonna teach you today is a superior movement for activating all of the musculature 
of the spine to protect the spine versus drawing in. Drawing in is the technique, again, of sucking the belly button towards the spine. We've heard about this a lot. It's fantastic for activating the transverse abdominis, this deep core muscle that acts like a corset, but it doesn't activate all the other muscles that can help protect the spine. And it's not something that you'd wanna do if your body was under load, right? If you think about how you go pick something heavy up, everybody naturally takes a big breath in, creates a lot of pressure in their belly, and then goes to pick things up that way. That's how we naturally lift things. Uh, drawing the belly button towards your spine is not the best way to activate the core. So sorry if I'm disappointing anybody out there who has heard that, um, but I'm gonna teach you the right way here in just a sec, all right? Okay, so if you can imagine my friend Skelly here with some muscles on Skelly's body, all right? There's muscles inside the core that go horizontally around your waist like this, all right? The transverse abdominis, the internal obliques, those are the muscles that wrap around the waist. And when those muscles are active, they pull inward like this. They pull in and they create tension. There's muscles at the bottom and the top of the core, the pelvic floor and the diaphragm, okay? When we learn how to use the transverse abdominis, the internal obliques, the, you know, the, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, when we learn to use these in unison, what happens is you can imagine that it's like this container, like a soda can, okay? And what happens if you have a soda can that's uncracked, right? An uncracked soda can is strong, it's sturdy, and there's no movement that's gonna happen. So if you can imagine from the pelvis all the way into the bottom of the ribs up here, a soda can of tension of muscles. You're not gonna hurt your lower back when you have that tension inside your core that supports your spine. But now let's crack the soda can and let's put a dent in it. Now what happens when something pulls on your spine to the side or to the front or whatever it may be? Well, snap, bulging disc, ouch, something's gonna happen because it's not as strong because it doesn't have the ability to fire all of the muscles in the way that it was meant to. And so if we don't learn how to fire all the muscles that create that intra-abdominal pressure, that soda can to protect the spine, well then guess what? We're gonna end up with lower back pain. The good news is I'm gonna teach you how to do it right now. So I'm gonna start on the floor because I feel like this is the best way to teach this movement. And I'm gonna walk you through the progression on how to learn the elevator. Now, something I wanna say right now is that when we first start teaching people the elevator at We Shape, which we do for everybody in every workout because it's a foundational movement that most people don't know how to do, which is activate their cores. We get a common thing here, which is, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm confused, I, I don't get it, right? So if you're trying to follow along to this and it just feels awkward and you're not sure what's, what's happening, that's normal. And I'll describe to you the process by which you'll probably go through as you learn how to do the elevator properly over the course of let's say six or so months, right? <laughs> so to start, these are the people, your fingers, and your belly is the elevator. And so if here is my belly button and here is my hip bone right here, I want you to take those fingers and you want to put them in between your belly button and your hip bone in this soft, fleshy area in your belly. You want to push down into it till you feel your fingers push down into your belly. Now from there, what I want you to do is this. I want you to take a big breath in and I want you to lift those people on the elevator and, and push your belly out. Hold it like that and push that belly out, especially that lower abdomen. If you don't feel like it's tight all the way around, right here where your fingers are, you can even test above your hips by your ribs. If it's not solid there, then take a bigger breath in and push your fingers out on the sides, right? We wanna push our fingers out. As we do this, what we're doing is we're creating intra-abdominal pressure with our breath. We're activating those muscles that wrap around the corset, and then we're activating the muscles in the pelvic floor and the diaphragm that create that soda can effect. Now, at first, what's gonna happen is this. You're gonna take a big breath in, and you'll push the fingers out, and the moment you exhale, everything's gonna go away. That's totally normal. What that means is you have poor mind-muscle connection with this group of muscles. So this is not a core exercise, like a crunch or a sit up, where you're gonna feel the muscles on the front side of your core, these visible muscles, the rectus abdominis, working and pumping. This is a neurological exercise, where you're gonna feel these muscles flicker on and off, and you'll start to shake eventually as we practice this drill a little bit more, and then you'll know I'm doing it right, when you can get it active, when you can feel the fingers going out, and when you can feel the muscles start to shake and flicker, and you're trying to turn them on, but they wanna turn off, right? So at first, it starts with the big breath. And then we exhale and we repeat. And we just try to hold that tension. Now, once we're able to feel like there's tension around our whole core, now we're gonna replace the big exhale with a shallow exhale and a shallow inhale. So pushing the fingers out, big breath. Now shallow exhale, keep the fingers up. Shallow inhale, shallow exhale, shallow inhale. And repeat that until you feel like you have to take a rest. 
okay? That might be 10 seconds, that might be 30 seconds. The goal will be, can you push those people up on the elevator and hold that for 60 seconds? Can you do that while taking shallow breaths? Now, if you're able to do that while taking shallow breaths, and it's not flickering boom, 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 up and down like this the whole time, right? Then what you're gonna wanna do is push it up, right? And then take a full exhalation without losing the tension in the core. Full inhalation, then full exhalation. Can we hold it for 60 seconds while maintaining that lift in the core while breathing all the way? Then we can go to more advanced variations where we push it up and we have a conversation. We talk with somebody. We are able to maintain that mind-muscle connection that creates that intra-abdominal pressure and that abdominal bracing that protects the spine and the lower back. The best part about this is too, when we create that intra-abdominal pressure, that balloon not only stabilizes the spine, but it lengthens the space between the discs, which can actually heal disc herniation issues, which can heal lower back issues, which can heal nerve pinch issues. So when I say that the elevator is the most important thing you could learn from this Q&A session, I am not lying. If you were to walk away with one thing, it's to do this elevator, okay? Now, once you're able to do this while lying down, which by the way, again, set that alarm or build the habit AM, PM. Before you get out of bed, practice for one minute. Before you go to bed at night, practice for one minute. And remember the feeling. You can even close your eyes. What does it feel like to activate your core the way I'm describing? Because you're gonna need to know what that feels like as you do other movements to make sure that you're protecting your spine. So once you're able to do that on your back, I like to recommend to people <coughs> to come up to a seated position. Same exact drill. Fingers push into the belly like this. We push the fingers out. And we're able to breathe. We're able to have a conversation while we hold those fingers out, okay? Now, if you can do that for a minute in a seated position, then I'm gonna graduate to a standing position and then talk about picking stuff up off the ground, okay? Mm. Woo-wee, this is a long Q&A call, you guys. So in a standing position, coming up to a standing position, and I'm gonna take my fingers, I'm gonna put them in the same exact spot, and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna push my fingers out, and I'm gonna hold that core tension while I breathe in, while I talk, while I move my body. Now in this position, we can start practicing, can we hold this core tension while moving our body subtly, while marching, right? Can I hold this core tension while marching? Great, that's a really good sign that we're able to stabilize our spine during movement, right? And watch, as I hold this core tension, if I have an anterior pelvic tilt, if I go and I do this, well, guess what? The anterior pelvic tilt goes away. My pelvis comes back underneath my hips like that. So it's important for all types of lower back issues, SI joint issues, right? Now, the number one reason people end up hurting themselves with their lower backs is because of this. Oops, I dropped something. Oh, I went to pick it up. I bent forward, I rounded, I twisted. I went to go stand up. Ah, some sort of nerve, some sort of you know, issue with my discs got pinched because I wasn't moving properly, okay? And so right now, if you have lower back pain, the first thing you need to understand is this concept of the core functioning the way I've described. Then we need to learn how to activate the core in the way I've described, which just means building that mind-muscle connection with the core in the way that I showed you, the elevator drill. Now, we have to learn how to apply the elevator drill as we learn how to move properly. So one of the best things we can do is practice what it feels like to pick something up off the ground in a way that's supposed to be pain-free. So how do we do this? We start with a wider stance with our toes turned outward. If we need a chair in front of us for support, that's 100% fine. Okay, I want you to do the easiest variation that you feel comfortable doing. From there, you're going to shift the weight back to your heels. You're going to push your butt back first and maintain that elevator, right? So elevator, heels, butt back. Now you're going to bend through the hips, bend to the knees with a flat lower back. You can see that my spine from the tailbone to the top of the head, it doesn't change position. And I'm going down to pick something up off the ground. Now for a lot of people, your hamstrings are probably tight. I already showed you my favorite move for the hamstrings. But if they're too tight and you feel like all of a sudden you go, oh wait, no, I'm, a, I'm starting to round my lower back like this, we've gone too far. That means we need to keep stretching the hamstrings and practice this movement with a restricted range of motion, maybe where our hands only come down to our shins or maybe even our knees, okay? But practicing this movement, the hip hinge, being able to push the butt back, weight on the heels, keep that elevator in the core active, and then push through the heels, squeeze the glutes and extend the hips. This is one of the most important motions that we need to learn how to do in order to get through our daily life because it allows us to pick things up off the ground in a way that's pain-free and isn't going to hurt our bodies. And over time, if we want, <coughs> I 
We can measure our progress by saying, I can get to my kneecaps. And then a few weeks later, I can get to my shins. And a few weeks later is I can get my palms underneath my kneecaps. And a few weeks later is I can touch the tops of my ankles. And a few weeks later is I can touch the tops of my feet and then the ground and then fingers flat on the ground, et cetera, okay? So practicing that movement through the hips as we bend forward to pick stuff up is so critical for people with lower back issues. And combining that with the concept of how to properly activate our core and actually doing it by practicing the elevator, those two things are gonna help 90% of people with lower back pain solve their problem. But again, it's only going to work if you do it consistently. And again, what I said earlier on when we're talking about walking and balance drills is one of the best ways to become consistent with a new habit is what? Anybody? Anchor it to an existing habit, all right? So you sleep at night in bed, don't you? Okay, so if you have tight hamstrings and you have a hurt lower back and you don't know how to activate your core, perhaps the routine you should take away from this Q&A is this. I wake up in the morning, I practice my elevator, I stretch my left hamstring, I stretch my right hamstring, I swing my legs over to the edge of the bed, I put my weight in my heels, I stand up and I practice 10 slow and controlled hip hinges, just like this, while maintaining that elevator lift, and then I go on about my day. And then before I go to bed, I do 10 hinges through the hips with the elevator active, I lay down, I stretch my hamstring left, I stretch my hamstring right, and then I practice the elevator for one minute, right? This is a three minute routine you could do twice a day that would probably change most of the people on this call who have lower back pain, probably change your life significantly because you'd be building the core activation, the core strength, and the movement quality necessary to change the way that your body feels when you're doing these critical movements in daily life, like picking stuff up off the ground. And again, this is about slowly building more mindfulness. So many of us move our bodies throughout space all the time in our houses, in our daily lives, and we never think about whether we're moving the bo our body well. And then we end up hurt, we wonder why it happened. Well, it's because we're not moving our bodies well, right? So I've given you the tools now to activate that core and how to hinge through the hips. And so now it's your job to set those reminders, anchor it to an old habit, and start doing this consistently so you can start improving that lower back pain, all right? So I'm gonna keep going on lower back for a few more minutes, and then we're gonna move forward a little bit. Um, okay, so I got another thing for the lower back that I think is really important to talk about, and that's your seated position, okay? Because if we constantly put ourselves into that rounded lower back position, that rounded upper back position, then we're gonna cause a lot of pain in our lower back. So I'm gonna turn my body sideways. So even if there's not a chair back behind me, I'll show you kind of from a side angle because it'll give you guys the best perspective on a seated position. A lot of people with lower back pain, what you'll find is they sit like this, okay? So I'm gonna wait, I see the camera's gonna pan down to my lower back here. So um, they sit like this where the back is rounded, okay? And when the back is rounded like this, it's just not gonna do anything for you, all right? It's not gonna do anything for you because it's gonna put a lot of pressure in the lower back. It's gonna put a lot of pressure on the spine. It's gonna be folding these discs forward and compressing the spine like we're talking about a lot, okay? So instead of sitting like this, I want you to do this. As you sit down, if you're sitting down to watch TV, if you're sitting down to do your work, whatever it may be, pause for a second. And then take your hand and you grab onto your butt cheek, right? And you lift that butt cheek up and you try to sit on the top of your hamstring on that side. Now come to the other side, roll over, grab that butt cheek, lift that butt cheek, sit on the top of that hamstring. You might be bent forward like this, that's totally fine. Now from there, keep sitting on the top of the hamstrings, slowly come to an upright position, and you'll notice I have a nice little natural curve in the lower back still. Now what is this doing for me? This is actually stretching my hamstrings while I sit. On top of that, I'm not putting pressure on my SI joint. If I flex this part of my spine, this lumbar spine forward, right? If I flex this forward, it's putting pressure on the hips. It's putting pressure on the SI joint. If I flex this part forward, if I sit in this bad posture position, it's gonna put pressure on the SI joint. So instead of doing this, sit up on those hamstrings, right? Find that good posture, sit nice and tall, and then go do your work, right? One of the best ways to experience this is to make sure that you're not leaning into the back of the chair all day long. It's almost always that we lean back into our chairs, our couches, et cetera, that brings us into this really poor posture position. So oftentimes by getting a chair with no back or making sure that you're not leaning against the back for at least some portion of the day can help us improve the posture, help us put our pelvis right underneath our spine in a nice alignment, which will 
help us remove the, the causes of lower back pain uh, in general. So that can be really helpful for you. Okay, um, I already mentioned this twice in the video, but I will go back to it and just say it one more time. If you have anything in your house that you can traction your lower back with, that means uh, the sink stretch that I showed you earlier or a pull-up bar. And the goal is you grab onto the pull-up bar into your door trim, whatever it may be, something you can hang on a little bit. You don't have to be able to hang all the way, but just grab onto and then just let your shoulders come up, let your back hang down and take some deep breaths and just imagine you're creating length in the spine. That can be a really great thing to decompress the spine and create more space between the vertebrae that can be more healing, especially if we do this before bed because all day long we're upright, we're slowly slipping in posture. If we do a little bit of tractioning and lengthening in our spine before bed, and then we go lay down in bed, well, then we're not putting that gravity and pressure, we're allowing our spine to be in that really long position. So that's one of my favorite times to do it. And again, if you have a sink at your house, grabbing onto the sink, sitting back through the butt, and letting your butt just pull your body backwards, the sink stretch is what I like to call it. It's another way to do this without having to have a pull-up bar or anything to hang from, okay? But that's one of my favorite ways to um, create space in the lower back. So. Um, I know we had a lot of specific questions about the lower back herniations and things like that, but I highly recommend anybody who's having lower back pain to try those things. The elevator, the hamstring stretch. If you have anterior pelvic tilt, do the hip flexor stretch as well. And then also doing the hinging through the hips, practicing hinging through the hips while maintaining the elevator. Those few things will do immense amounts for you in terms of strengthening your body in the ways it needs to be strengthened creating flexibility for your body, creating coordination in your body, especially in your core, and creating better movement. Because remember, you've heard me say it like five times already, when you move your body better, you feel better in your body. All right. We are going to do a little bit more on, um, on uh, aches, pains, and injuries. I want to make sure I have enough time to talk about strength. Um, we had a handful of questions about strength and flexibility as well. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, we have been going for two hours straight on our live Cyber Monday Q&A. So thank you so much for everybody who's watching thus far. I really appreciate it. Um, give us a heart. Give us a like. You know, Give us a comment. Let us know how we're doing in terms of answering questions and giving you useful information to help you feel better in your body. Um, we're going to try to go for about one more hour. We'll see if I can make it all the way through. Um, and again, we're going to talk about cramps. Um, We'll talk a little bit about uh, hips <laughs> and then knees a little bit, and hopefully we'll get into some of the stability and strength and stuff like that too. So I might have to go a little faster here uh, to get through everything that we possibly can on this list, all right? Um, now, if you guys have been watching this video and you've been, you've been liking it, you like the content, and you wanna get more access to myself uh, or Dr. Lisa where you can do one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls, um, or if you'd like us to design you your very own personalized at-home workout, all you gotta do is press play, follow along, give us feedback, and the workout adjusts to your individual capabilities. And that means if you're laying in bed and can't even sit up, we've got exercises for you. If you're more athletic, we've got exercises for you. Um, if you wanna get more access to us, if you want us to make you that workout, well then you gotta try WeShape, okay? That's what this whole social media channel is all about is WeShape. WeShape, our goal is to teach people through our workouts and through our live coaching and through our movement snacks, how to move your body better so that you feel better in your body. Now. Right now, it's Cyber Monday, and for everybody watching, we're giving you 65% off any WeShape plan. So if you're on YouTube or Facebook, click the link above or below. If you're on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or Facebook, you can click the link in our bio. And if you want to just type in the URL, you go WeShape, W-E-S-H-A-P-E.com backslash question, the word question. That will take you straight to that page. And here's the deal. This is only live for nine more hours. 65% off any membership, including our yearly membership, which means that's the best deal that you'll ever get at WeShape. Um, and you could get your workouts covered for almost all of 2024 if you act on this deal right now. But it's nine hours left. After that, we're not gonna have this deal anymore. You're gonna go to that page and you can still try out WeShape through our quiz and through our free workouts, um, but you can't get the 65% off the membership after that timer goes to zero, okay? So let's talk about muscle cramps, okay? Mm. So I've got questions from a handful of people. Um, Simmons, Lydia, I think there was one earlier talking about muscle cramps, um, Debbie as well. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk about muscle cramps real quick. Oftentimes muscle cramps can be an electrolyte deficiency. Okay, so at WeShape, we typically don't talk about like nutrition type stuff, but generally speaking, I've seen electrolytes change someone's life when it came to cramping and also hydration, okay? So a quick recommendation, and again, this is just a recommendation to try. We're not your doctor, we're not your guru, right? Sodium, potassium, and magnesium are essential for 
balance of electrolytes in your body. So if you're moving your body a lot, you're sweating a lot, or even if you're just having lots of aches and pains and cramps in your body, I would try taking 5,000 milligrams of sodium, 1,000 milligrams of potassium, ideally in the form of potassium chloride or potassium citrate, and 300 milligrams of magnesium, preferably in the form of magnesium malate, every day for at least a week, and see if that makes a difference on the cramps that you're getting in your body. Another thing you can also try out is increasing your water intake to see if that hydration allows your nerves to function more efficiently, which can help deal with some of those issues with cramping. Now, this is um, not a plug. I'm not going to get anything from this, but our friends who uh, actually got this recommendation from over at Element, which is a company that creates an electrolyte drink. It's L-M-N-T is how you spell it. Um, they make amazingly delicious electrolyte drinks that don't use artificial sweeteners or sugar. And um, they have this balance of magnesium, potassium, and, uh, and sodium that can help you replenish those electrolytes. So think about it like um, Gatorade, but without all the crap and sugars and food colorings and things like that. They come in these packets that you mix in with water. I take this every day. Um, I think it's fantastic for um, you know, balancing the electrolytes, especially if you sweat a lot, do a lot of work, and um, oftentimes can help people with those cramps. So give that a shot if you guys have cramps. I really hope that helps you out. Um, <laughs> okay, we're gonna talk about hips a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna talk about knees a little bit, and then we're gonna go on to strengthening stuff before we run out of issues here. Okay, so hips. I'm gonna make this one a little more broad. I see questions here from Paul, Sandy, Jonathan, uh, Michelle, Kristen, Rachel, um, Sacred Sky, Lillian. There's a lot of questions about hips. Um, a lot of the stuff that I share with you with the lower back is gonna be helpful for the hips. So the elevator is really, really critical. For the SI joint, again, one of the things I've found for hips and knees to restore full range of motion and create space inside the capsules is being able to sit in the squat or being able to do that kneeling squat movement I showed you earlier in this Q&A call. Um, both of those are gonna help the hips a lot, okay? That being said, one of the reasons why most people have hip pain is because they lack internal and external rotation stability of the hip capsule. Have you guys heard me say this before? Golfer's elbow and tennis elbow, internal and external rotation of the elbow. Shoulder pain, internal and external rotation of the shoulder. Hip pain, internal and external rotation of the hip socket, right? So, so much of our lives is focused on forward and backwards, side to side. But rarely do we focus on strengthening our body in a rotational pattern. Twisting, 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 twisting all of the joints of our body. And so oftentimes with the hip, there can be a major imbalance of your internal and external flexibility and your internal and your external stability of your hip joint. And this can oftentimes balance the hip out if you get it right, causing less hip pain, and oftentimes can even help with knee pain, ankle pain, SI joint pain, and lower back pain. So I'm gonna talk about internal and external rotation first and show you how you know, you know whether one or the other is, is the issue that you might be experiencing, okay? So I'm gonna push this back, come down to the floor here. Um, you can do this on the floor. You can do this in a low chair. You can do this seated on a pillow if you need a little bit of support. The lower your body is uh, relevant to the floor, the harder this will be. The higher your hips are from the floor, the easier this will be, okay? So what we're gonna do is come into what's called a hip 90-90 position like this. So you're gonna have a 90 degree bend in this leg and a 90 degree bend in this knee here. And there'll be about a 90 degree angle between your hips like this. Now in this position, if you're starting to bring yourself upright and you feel a pinch right here on the outside of your hip, oh my God, this is not happening. Immediately I'm gonna tell you that you have an internal rotation issue on this hip. Vice versa, if you can't let this hip come to the outside, this one won't drop to the outside. You probably have a lot of tightness in the external rotation of this hip. Now what we wanna do is we wanna switch the other side so you can either keep your feet where they are or you can just bring your body and rotate over. So you're gonna rotate over like this and you're gonna bring your feet to the other side. You're gonna feel the same. Where is this tight? If you can't bring your knee down or if you have to lean your body back on this top leg right here, internal rotation issue on this side. If you can't bring your knee to the outside like this, external rotation on this side or if there's pain in that, right? One of my favorite drills for addressing both of these issues at the same time is the move that I'm showing you right here, the hip 90-90. Now at first with the hip 90-90, you might do it while sitting in a chair. So you might literally sit in a chair with a wide stance and then literally just drop the knees and open the hip like this and then drop the knees and open the hip like this. You might start here and that might be enough for you to feel the stretch. And you do this for 60 to 90 seconds every day 
once a day, twice a day to try and loosen up that hip exter external and internal rotation of the hips, right? Then we can come down to the floor. We can sit on an object, usually a pillow, a stack of pillows, a couch cushion, whatever lifts our hips off the floor. This is gonna make it a little bit harder, right? So we're gonna go down here and we're gonna bring our hands behind us and do some hip 90-90s like this, okay? And you can lean back as far as you need. And then eventually we bring the pillow out and we keep doing hip 90-90s, right? With our body on the ground, our hands behind us. And then how do we know that we've gotten enough hip internal external rotation? We start to walk the hands up so our chest is more upright as we go from side to side. And the goal I've always told people is you go from one 90 degree position with your hands out front all the way over to the other 90 90 position with your hands out front. So that's how we know we've got good hip internal and external rotation is if we can do a hip 90 90 while sitting on the ground without having to use our hands be behind our backs for support. <clears throat> so this is a great stretch or a mobility drill rather that you can do every single day to get that hip internal and external rotation. If either one of these motions is challenging, so if I'm here and I have hip internal rotation issues, right? Well, I can pause in this position and to, to stretch this hip internal rotation issue, all I have to do is turn my body towards the knee and move my belly button towards there. So I'm thinking about turning my body towards this and bringing it downward like this. That's gonna stretch the outside of the hip that gives you more internal rotation. If it's causing any issues in the knees, lift your toes towards your nose, flex the toes the entire time, that should help stabilize the knee joint as well. If I'm having issues with this side, then what I can do is I can lean a little bit more forward and bring my body down towards the shin of this side, right? So I'm trying to bow towards that shin and that's gonna feel a stretch on the outside of my hip on this leg right here. And same thing for the opposite side, I go to the other side, if I have that internal rotation issue, I'm gonna turn my body towards it, and I'm gonna lean towards it. If I have that rotation on the external rotation here, I'm gonna bow my belly towards my shin and feel that stretch happening on the outside of the hip, okay? So there's a couple ways we can stretch hip internal and external rotation. That's gonna be really helpful in restoring the flexibility that we need for the hips to be able to let those hips um, open up again and feel good, okay? Now, secondarily to this is learning how to build hip stability. And I'm gonna walk you through my favorite movement when it comes to learning hip stability. And I have a belief actually, it's kind of interesting. We have this movement in a lot of people's programs very consistently because to me, it's one of those master movements. If you can do this movement well, then you have good foot arch, good knee alignment, good hamstring flexibility, good use of your glutes, good activation of your core, good posture, et cetera. So that's why I think this movement's so important. There are movements out there that if you practice them consistently, they will benefit you in so many ways, it's ridiculous, all right? Mm. Now I'm gonna show you the hardest version of this movement real quick, which is called the drinking bird, okay? One-legged drinking bird. Then I'm gonna rewind and I'm gonna show you some variations leading up to this so you can see that it's not always the case that you have to be able to do everything at the same time, all right? You, you can slowly work your way up to it. So I'm gonna put my foot down. I'm gonna activate my arch. I'm going to put my hands on my hips. I'm gonna pull my elbows behind my back tall posture to the top of the head. I'm gonna shift my weight so that my whole body weight's over this one foot. From there, I'm gonna hinge to the hip with a slight bend of the knee with my pelvis facing the ground. I'm gonna come down ideally to a parallel position to the ground. I'm gonna squeeze my glute and I'm gonna bring my body back to that upright position. I'm gonna transfer my knee through and fully extend the hip like this. Now this movement is so important, right? Because if I can do this movement on one foot, well guess what? I can pick stuff off of the ground with good form. I can. I can balance myself laterally if I'm running. I can run, I can go upstairs, I can jump, I can land. There's so many things that this movement helps. Um, that's why it's so dang important, okay? Now I know most people probably look at this and go, never gonna happen. Well, I challenge you not to talk to yourself like that. It could happen because we can do everything from a starting point and work our way up to it. So what's the starting point? Starting point on this one is we get a chair for support. And just like I showed you earlier in this video, put your foot down, get your arch active, and find balance on one foot with your knee up like this, okay? So keep working on this balance drill until we've slowly removed all of our fingers and we're able to hold this balanced position for 60 seconds on the left side, 60 seconds on the right side with an active arch and we're not rotating our knee from side to side as we're doing it the whole time. We're finding that really good balance where our belly button is right over our foot and our nose is right over our belly button, right? and we're feeling that burn through the outside of the hip that's stabilizing the hip socket. <clears throat> Once we're able to do this for 60 seconds, okay, on the left side and the right side, which could take you a year, could take you a year to go from barely balancing 
on this to working your way down to one finger to lifting it up and then finally being able, wow, I can actually balance on one foot. That's fine. It's worth it. It's worth spending the time doing this because it only takes you two minutes a day, okay? From there, once you get that, putting the hands on the hips and starting by doing a kickback and touching the toe with the hips forward. Don't open the hips, right? Hips forward. And then just standing back to that upright position and squeezing the glute and finishing the hip. And just toe comes a little bit behind you like this and you're using it for support and then back up to the top position. So you're starting here and you're working like 10 reps a day, every day, right and left. And then we're doing this. We're coming into a deeper position and tapping our toe and then coming back up like this. And then eventually after we're doing 10, 20 reps of that, we're coming into that full position and coming up like that. So you can see over time, we want you to gradually work up to being able to do a drinking bird, starting with just balance and then working through small ranges of motion, bigger ranges of motion, and then finally full ranges of motion so that you can work that hip strength. Again, this is such a great movement because you're working that external and internal rotation of the hip. You're working the extension and the flexion of the hip at the same time and you're creating lateral stability. So you're working all the planes of motion at the same time. It's literally my favorite move when it comes for the hip, for the lower back, for the lower body in general, because if you can do it, you could probably do a lot of the other movements out there uh, in a way that's pretty good. And if you can get this one right, it's going to help you move your body better in so many ways so that you can feel better in your body in so many ways at the same time. Um, now, I just wanna mention, and I, I feel like this is a good spot to mention this. Again, at WeShape, a lot of the workouts that we create have this movement, the drinking bird in there. And the beginner variation of the drinking bird isn't even the balance drill I just showed you. It's, it's laying down in bed and it's pushing your heel into the ground and it's going like this, the butt muscle and then relaxing and squeezing the butt muscle and then relaxing and then coming into an upright position and then learning how to come forward through the hips and then back like this. And then there's two legged variations and then there's a balance drill and then there's the, the variations I just showed you. And that's kind of how we operate at WeShape. What we use in our workouts is a system called motor pattern progressions, meaning instead of adding repetitions or adding weight to your workouts like you'd see at a gym, we try to make the movement just a little bit harder in terms of strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination over time. And when we consistently make the movement a little bit harder in terms of the strength required, the flexibility required, the balance, and the coordination required, well, guess what? you build all those elements at the same time. And you build the coordination that allows you to move your body freely in space in a way that you actually feel good, okay? So if you wanna learn the drinking bird, feel free to try and do the balance drill and follow our progression. If you wanna incorporate it into your home workouts and you wanna use this philosophy that I just mentioned, motor pattern progressions, teaching you how to move your body better by slowly sophisticating all of the motions that you have mastery over. Well, then you gotta try We Shape. And today is Cyber Monday, and we're doing it for 65% off, and your workouts will have the drinking bird progression in there, and it will walk you step-by-step step on how to go from the most beginner variation I just showed you all the way to the variation I just showed you at the very beginning of that segment, okay? So if you wanna check it out, click the link above or below. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, head on over to the link in our profile, click that link, or type in weshape.com backslash question, and you will save 65% off on Cyber Monday for another eight hours and 45 minutes, all right? All right, we got about 45 minutes left. So let's talk about knees right here. Um, okay, I got some people talking about the meniscus. And again, sometimes I gotta be the bearer of bad news. So Liz, Peg, uh, uh, Silvana, I think, um, are all asking questions as it relates to the meniscus, okay? <laughs> and so here's, here's the unfortunate truth that I've come to discover after having five knee surgeries and having meniscus injuries and, and things like that. Um, when we start to wear down our meniscus or when we have a tear in our meniscus, a hitch of pain in a particular movement pattern. So if I'm going to sit down and at a certain point in that squat, I go, ah, and it feels like somebody's stabbing me in the knee, um, that's a meniscus tear. And you can go in and have a scope and a scope surgery, what they'll do is they'll polish that meniscus down and it'll probably remove that you know, hitchy pain. But eventually over time, that meniscus wears and wears and wears and you end up with what's called bone on bone knee pain. I've been there. Unfortunately, I've had bone on bone knee pain because I tore my ACL, I got it reconstructed. That one tore as well because it was put back in a, in a poor positioning. And then it slowly just polished my meniscus down to a point where it's bone on bone. There's not a lot of cartilage and meniscus in there. And um, so there's a couple things. One, learning how to move through your hips is really helpful. Oftentimes when people squat, right, they're gonna like, they're gonna bend through the knees like this, and that's gonna put a lot of pressure on the knees. So learning how to move through the hips to pick stuff up, 
learning how to move through the hips like we talked with the drinking bird, so helpful for helping your body um, not put a ton of pressure on the knees and the hip, uh, on the knees, knee joint and putting a lot more pressure on the hip joint. So it's just learning how to transfer a lot of the, um, the distribution of load from the joint that's hurting to a joint that can hold that load. So learning how to move through the hips is really important. You know, so when we're squatting, don't squat with the knees forward, squat with the butt pushed back like this, right? Um, there's a handful of surgeons in the country that actually do meniscus transplants. Um, I had that done and it was a game changer for me. Um, so that's something that you can consider experimenting with. Um, I think that there's some injectables and stuff that you can do for a little while, but again, a meniscus isn't gonna regrow. Um, it's gonna wear down over time. So the best thing to do is have quality movement, distribute the load from the knee to the hips a little bit more and learn how to move your body better that way. And then eventually if you need to, either some sort of meniscus replacement or oftentimes people end up with um, a knee replacement surgery. And I don't want people to beat themselves up if they have to go with a knee replacement. In fact, my mom had horrible knees. There was always pain in her knees and she had knee replacement. And even though it was a, a big hassle for a few months, it completely changed the way that she felt and the way that she was able to move her body. And so I think sometimes these things are uh, miracles for people. So don't write them off if you're in, in pain and suffering a lot. It could be really beneficial for you in the long run. Um, okay, so we're talking about knees. I got a couple from Tish. Um, so I got leg exercises for the knees, um, foam roller for the knees. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Half lunges, they feel pain in their knees. Okay, I'll do them one step at a time. So Tish, let's do foam rolling first, all right? I'm gonna grab a foam roller. How do we foam roll the quads? I'll stand up and kind of show you kind of the direction where we wanna go, is if you look at the quads, right, it's called the quad muscle because there's four leg muscles. So that means there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here, right? So if you think about it as basically like two in the middle, one on the side, one on the deep side over here. All we wanna do with a, a, a foam roller is we wanna go up a few inches, down an inch, up a few inches, down a few inch on the quad until we find a tight spot. And then we wanna do that up and down on each one of the muscles, right? So in the interest of time, I'm gonna show you kind of how to do this on one side here, and then, um, then you can try it out on the other side. So you're gonna start at the top of the kneecap, right? And I put one leg to the outside like this, and one leg on top of the foam roller. I'm gonna pick one direction to go. So right now I'm kind of rolling on, let's say, let's do it like this for, for view sake. I'm rolling kind of towards the outside of my quad, close to the IT band, but not all the way on the IT band, okay? Right, so from here, I'm just gonna slowly roll down and then up. And I'm looking for a spot that feels like I'm pushing a button that feels like, ah! like super painful, right? So, oh, oh, there it is. I hit that button right there. Once you find that button, what you can do is rock side to side and take some deep breaths and tell that muscle, relax and go, ah, relax. It's safe to relax. You're okay, it's safe to relax. And what you'll feel is after around 30 seconds, most of the time, that muscle will go like this, bah, and it'll soften out, it'll flatten out. And then you can kind of continue just going one inch up, one inch down, all the way up that, that muscle right there until you get to the hip, right? and get all the way to the hip like this, and then you can rotate to the next muscle, and you can work your way down, and just work your way all the way down the quad to the kneecap, and then you can rotate to the next muscle, and work your way all the way down, up again, and then back down, right? So a full quad foam rolling routine might take you 10 minutes, call it two or so minutes um, up, two or so minutes down on each leg, right? Um, so actually it's a little longer, maybe 15, maybe 15 minutes to do both quads, but if you have knee pain, if you have knots in your knees, Doing a foam roll quad routine can be highly beneficial at making your legs feel significantly better in the long run, okay? So you can give that a shot if you have knee issues. Um, so what exercises are best for bad knees legs? Without a doubt, there's only two things that I think are absolutely critical for people to be able to do, okay? Number one is squat or stand up from a chair. Number two is lunge or walk upstairs or run or any of those types of movements, okay? So what's more important than the exercises though is the keys that you need to know to healthy knees, right? So we made a video a while back about the three keys to healthy knees. I'm gonna go through that right now because it's so dang important, all right? Number one key is, are we putting pressure on the knees and the quads or are we putting pressure on the hips? Because if I think about this movement, a squat or any sort of movement where I extend through the knee, if I use just the quad muscle, it's gonna pull that capsule together so if I have bone on bone pain or arthritis, could cause issues. It could cause issues if I have patellofemoral pain right here because I'm pulling through the patella ton, right? So if I'm gonna stand up like this, if I bring my center of gravity in front where my knees are in front of my toes, my weight's in my toes, and I go to stand up like this, well, yeah, if you're strong, you can do it. But if you have bad knees, bringing your knees in front of your toes like this and trying to sit down like that, it's gonna cause a lot of knee pain. So instead of bringing your weight distribution forward on your toes, keep the weights at least 75% in your heels, right? So as I stand up, 
I'm gonna literally feel like all the way to my heels, all the way to my heels. I'm gonna bow forward from my chest through the hips. I'm not gonna round my back. I'm just gonna bring my body forward and I'm gonna push through the heels and I'm gonna feel my butt muscles working as I stand up and extend the hips, all right? So it really means I'm going to push my butt back, my weight's on the heels, right? I'm doing this motion, not this motion, right? So many people when they squat, they bring the knees forward first. If your butt's not going back first, then you're putting all the pressure on the knee joint and you're not putting pressure through the hip joint, which is much stronger. And as we stand up right here, as I'm standing up here, I'm not focused on knee extension. I'm not focused on pushing out through my knee. I'm focused on hip extension. I'm focused on bringing the back of my hamstring behind me, right? So I'm here, I feel my hamstrings. Now push my hamstrings backwards and extend the hips. That's gonna take the pressure off the knees and put them onto the glutes, all right? Another principle for healthy knees, making sure that the knees are going the same direction as your toes. This one is such a common issue that I see with people making. They go to stand up from a chair, they put their feet down, boom, their knees come in like this, their toes are out like that, right? I wanna bring this knee, knee model over here for this. This is really important, okay? The knee and the elbow are hinge joints. What are they supposed to do? Forward, back, forward, back, like this, right? Forward, back, forward, back. And what we do is we go to stand up from a chair, we're bending our knees like this. We go to stand up from a chair, we rotate out, and we twist inward, and then we come up like this, only with the patella pulling against the kneecap like that. It's putting so much rotational pressure inside the knee joint that can cause that meniscus to tear and wear down in the first place. So whenever we're doing lower body movements, even when we're walking, look down at your thigh. What direction is your thigh pointing, right? We want that thigh bone to be pointing this direction. And if I look down at my toes and I have my hand right there, that should be going the exact same direction as the toes, okay? So as I stand up from a squat, I wanna be mindful of my knees going the same direction as my toes. And then as I sit down, my knees go in the same direction as my toes. I'm not letting them wobble in. It's fine if they wobble. Just try to tame it. Move slow. Almost everybody out there can squeeze their quad. Just straighten your leg. The quad's tight. But while you're sitting in a chair, can you squeeze your glute muscles? Probably not. All right? But we need those glute muscles to be active in order to be able to do a squat properly. They're the strongest muscle in the lower body, and they're the most neglected and the, and the most inactive muscle compared to their strength on most people, especially with lower back pain, knee pain, et cetera. So if we can't fire our glutes coming down to the ground, on a bed, again, any of these belly movements can be done in bed, and building a connection with our glutes by doing a prone glute extension. So I'm here, right? I'm going to lift my knee off the ground a little bit, stomping the ceiling with my heel, and I'm gonna feel this butt muscle working to extend the hips, right? That's the feeling I wanna feel as I extend my hips in the squat. So if you're able to do this and squeeze the glute, and you're able to do this and squeeze the other glute, then what you can do is you can flip over onto your back now, and we can practice what it's supposed to feel like when we squat, so we're in a bridge, we drop our shoulders away from our ears, our palms toward the sky to make sure we have good posture. Now here's a trick here, lift your toes to your nose. And now from here, press your heels into the ground and squeeze your glutes the same way we just did on our belly and feel what it feels like to drive this motion from the hips. So we're not trying to push our quads out like this. We're trying to keep our heels down and we're trying to lift the hips up and squeeze those glutes. The glutes make the motion work, not the heels pushing forward in the ground through the quad, okay? So feel that motion, and then we can take this ground motion of activating the hips, and we can come back up to the squat, and we can go what? Bow forward through the hips, weights on the heels, knees tracking toes, and we're gonna stand up, and right here, oh, it should feel the same as the glute bridge, because we're using our glute muscles as the primary mover, not the quad muscles as our primary mover. Now again, I don't want people to think that having your knees over your toes is always a bad thing. It's actually amazing to be able to strengthen the ability to bring your knees over your toes. But the first step is learn how to do movements in a way that feels good using the big movers. And then the second step is restore the ability to go into those ranges of motion that currently hurt you after we learn the first step. But most people, they need to learn this first step first, all right? So those are the, knees, the keys to healthy knees. Knees over toes, weight in the heels, extending the hips through the glutes. That's really important, okay? So the movements that are great for the lower body, sit to stance. I swear, if we practice this sit to stand, just being able to do it, you can start out by putting your hands on your legs like this, right? You can then move to just not having any hands and having the chair behind you. You can then move to doing a fully extended sit to stand where we come all the way up on our toes, getting the calves involved. We can move to a sit to hop where you hop up and down on every single repetition, adding a little bit of power to it, but make sure you're not doing that until you've built good form on all these movements. You can remove the chair behind you and you can just do jump squats, right? Or we can increase the range of motion. So all of those are fantastic 
bodyweight movements that you can do from the comfort of your own home. And that was an example of a movement progression I just showed you that took you from very beginner movements and muscle activation drills to more dynamic movements, to things that required more range of motion, coordination, then speed, then power, and then the ability to jump and land, right? So that's a movement progression. And that's what we do at WeShape. We teach people how to start with basic movements and slowly work their way up to more and more difficult movements so that their body consistently gains strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination at the same time. Because those are the attributes that we believe will help you feel better in your body. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about the lunge because we had a couple people asking questions. One was when I do a half lunge, I feel pain in my knees. And then also Tish, you asked what are the best movements. I wanna share that one as well. Um, I also had one about uh, uh, somebody who does dance fitness um, and strength training a couple days a week, but pain in the back of the knee radiating down to the calf so they can't bend their knee fully. So I wanna sh share something there. So let's, let's talk about those last few things on the aches, pains, and injuries. Let's go to strength after that because I feel like we're gonna run out of time here. So um, if we're feeling pain, on our back leg as we're doing a lunge, right? So if I'm stepping out, I'm feeling pain in the back leg of doing lunge. It's quite likely that we're doing the opposite of what I just taught you, right? So if I want my lunge to feel good, I'm gonna put the weight on the front leg, I'm gonna come through the hip, I'm gonna bring my weight in the heel, I'm gonna come down in the half lunge, and I'm gonna come back up, right? And look at me, I'm literally like, my, look at my toe in the back. Like I could just barely use my toe in the back to do this half lunge. That's what I want. Because then I'm using the glutes, I'm using the, the front leg to do that movement. Oftentimes what people will do is they'll put 50% of the weight on their back leg, they'll go to the lunge like this, and what are you doing? You're putting 50% of your body weight in a knee that is all the way in front of the toe that is only using the quad muscle and not using the glute muscle to extend it at all. So the recommendation I would have for this is if you're having pain in that back knee, allow yourself to bend forward through the hips, put way more pressure on the butt muscle, the outside of the butt muscle on that front leg, and really de-emphasize the pressure on that back leg and do your lunges from that position instead, okay? That's gonna be really important for you to make that feel significantly better. Um, when it comes to uh, inflammation in the back of the knee, um, one of my favorite things to do is, uh, is gap the knee, and another one is to do what's called muscle flossing. So I'll show you kind of both variations of this. Um, muscle flossing would be best done with a band. I don't think I have a band laying around here, so I'll show you with a towel and you can kind of try it out at home. But um, gapping the knee is this. If we have this inflammation back there and it feels like we can't bend the knee all the way, <laughs> oftentimes what I do when I feel like I wake up in the morning and I have that kind of, that rustiness in the knee is I take a nice towel, I roll it up, I put it behind the kneecap, I bend the knee like this, and I come into this position, I kind of just let that towel create a little bit of space inside the knee capsule as that knee comes into full flexion. So this can be a great way to loosen up a tight knee joint, especially as it relates to bending. So like what I'm saying is I wake up in the morning, I might bend my knee and go, oh, it feels like there's a ball of liquid in there. And so if I come in here and put this towel and I kind of do some of these movements right here, that towel and gapping the knee can create a little bit of space for that liquid to move around. And it can start to feel like I regain my flexibility. Then I remove that towel and look, oh wow, it feels good again. So gapping the knee can be really useful. Muscle flossing is a different technique. You could probably YouTube this. I probably won't go into too much detail, but you want a band, a nice flat rubber band type of thing that you'd use for exercise. And what you do is you wrap the joint that has a lot of inflammation in it. So for the knee, I would wrap it around and wrap it around, wrap it around pretty tight, right? Until it's nice and tight. It should feel like it's pinching in on you pretty good. And then I would kind of pump the knee, same way I just did through the range of motion, just trying to get lymph to move around for a minute or so. And then I take that floss off. And surprisingly, what happens is when we pump the knee, when it's constricted with a rubber band around it, it can move that lymph faster out of that area. So that can be a really helpful way to get that type of um, pain out of your knee. So you can give that a shot as well. Again, that's called muscle flossing. You can check that out probably anywhere. Um, Okay, let's see. I'm gonna move on to strength now. I know we have a few more questions, you guys. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't get to all the questions as it relates to pain. Clearly, the people who are following us at WeShape are experiencing aches, pains, and injuries. Um, I always have a lot of empathy for people who are in that condition. Again, if you're experiencing aches, pains, and injuries, and you want more help in that respect, and you want workouts that aren't super challenging, that are gonna be super, like, gonna damage your body, but you want workouts that actually help you gain strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination, um, you want to jump on live Q&A calls with myself or Dr. Lisa, who's a doctor of physical therapy, a really amazing woman who can help uh, teach you some movements that would help you feel better in your body, then check out WeShape. Like I said, right now, um, it's Cyber Monday, so we're doing 65% off. You can get access to that deal by typing in weshape.com backslash question, or if you're on our social media platforms, you can click on the link in our bio, or if you're on YouTube or Facebook, we got a link above or below where you can save 65% off. That is only gonna be live for eight and a half more hours, you guys, and then that deal is gonna run out. Um, the best part about that deal, I think, is that if you jump into the year plan, 
um, you can get basically almost all of 2024 done for you. Workout plans, access to live coaching, our feel good challenges, which are absolutely insane. They're like life changing challenges that we host and you get free access as a WeShape member. So right now, 65% off any of those plans. If you guys want to jump on that, I would love to see you on one of our live Q&A calls that we host inside the community. They're a much smaller group, you know, 20 or so people, and I can get face-to-face -face with you and make sure that I'm helping you with your specific issues, okay? <clears throat> okay, let's talk about strength and stability. Sorry if I've been hacking this whole time, you guys. I'm still recovering from a cold, but I'm gonna make it happen. We only got 30 minutes left. I can't believe we've, we're almost there, y'all. Woo! Mm. Okay. Ah. Jerome. What is the best exercise for your forearms without using weight? Thanks in advance. This is fantastic, Jerome. Uh, great question. Simple move. It's called wrist flex and extend, okay? And this is really simple. All I'm going to do is go fingers wide as possible. I'm going to bring them back towards my wrists like this until I feel the backs of my forearms fire. And then I'm going to make a tight fist. And I'm going to cock my wrist towards my forearms and bring them back into kind of a flexed position. And I'm going to go back and forth like this. Boom, boom. And I know it seems really simple. And you think, oh, that's too easy. Like, that's not going to strengthen your wrist. But watch. Do this every day for at least 90 seconds, okay? And if you want to, you can start to build more sets. And if you start to build more sets, you can even take more space in between, like more days in between, and treat this more like a, like a workout where you're doing it three days a week. Maybe the first day you do 90 seconds. Uh, the next day you do 90 seconds. You rest for a minute, and you do another 90 seconds. And then maybe you do it again, and you get like a third round in there. But this is one of the best ways to really build that strength and flexibility in your wrist without any equipment. And it's so fantastic for people who have carpal tunnel, for people who have weak wrists, um, and for people who need to develop that strength in their wrist, but they don't have access to any sort of equipment. So that's one of my favorite moves for stronger wrists that you can do anytime, anywhere. Um, Lorraine, is there an easy way to get off the floor when with nothing to hang on um, and you're overweight? Okay, Lorraine, uh, I'm really happy that you asked this. Last week in our members Q&A call, um, there was a lady there who's 88 and she found We Shape by fi finding a video of ours, which was how to get up off the ground pain-free. So we have a video that you can go search and look that up, but I am going to show you right now how to do that and see if you can follow the steps and see if it will help you get off the ground in a way that's pain-free, okay? So um, ideally, uh, we're, we're next to a surface, if that's possible, okay? If there's nothing around you to grab, that's fine, um, but I'll show you my best uh, chance of that, but ideally, we're close as we possibly can get to a surface, okay? So if I'm on my back and I fell, oh gosh, I can't get back up. I need to figure out how to get back up. The biggest mistake people make is they do this. They just kind of like, uh, or they like try to, uh, they just kind of wiggle around. They don't know which way to go. So what we want to work is you want to work in what's called a contralateral pattern, okay? What does that mean? That means I want to take my right leg or my left leg, right? And I want to take my opposite hand. So my right leg is up, my left hand is out. And what I want to do is this. I want to punch this direction with my hand, right? While I'm pushing into my heel. So it goes like this, punch and push, right? Now I'm up on my elbow. So your goal is to roll to your elbow like that, okay? So I'm on the ground, I'm going, huh, and I roll to my elbow. From there, I'm gonna place both my hands flat and I'm gonna walk myself up to a seated position, okay? Now in that seated position, I'm kind of like this. I'm gonna bring my one leg under, my one leg over like this. So now I'm in a kneeling position, like a side kneeling position like this. Then I'm gonna keep pressing my hands on the ground and I'm gonna come up to a kneeling position like this, okay? Now from there, I'm gonna press my hands real hard on the ground, I'm gonna lift my other foot up, and I'm gonna walk my hands back towards my legs, and I'm gonna walk my body up right like this. If you are able to roll yourself up and then scoot to a chair, it can always be useful to have a chair there because what we can do with the chair is the same thing. I'm here, instead of putting my hands down here and having to reach so far, I can put my hand on the chair, come into that kneeling position, and if I have my hands on the chair, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to get up from this position than if I have to put my hands all the way down on the ground. <laughs> the hardest part for most people though is that they try to just do a sit up to sit their bodies upright. So don't forget that first motion, that motion of my right leg is up, my left arm is out, and I punch over to get up to my elbow. When we use that contralateral pattern, we're using that glute, the hip extension, to help us get up and not just the core. When we combine those muscles together, oftentimes it can help people get off the ground in a way that um, is safe, pain-free, and um, it works for people who have uh, strength and flexibility restrictions that have made that hard. So I hope that helps everybody. We had a lady who said she found our video and she's like, as long as I follow Coach Tyler's advice, it always works. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. So that made me feel really good. Um, <clears throat> okay, 
Marzetta, I'm a 58-year-old woman with arthritis in both knees, neuropathy in hands and feet. I have sciatica, um, a lot of different other stuff. How do I begin exercising with the side effects of all the above mentioned? Where do I begin? Man, this is a good question, Marzetta, and I, I really, I really want to emphasize what I've been saying in this video a lot throughout the whole video, which is I feel like we need to change our definition of what exercise means. Almost everybody has been led to believe that exercise is um, exercise is sweating as hard as we can and pumping our muscles so we can burn fat, so we can shape our bodies, right? And so we end up on these fitness programs that are like, pop it up, let's go, you know, no pain, no gain, this kind of stuff. And people follow along to that, and what happens? We get injured. We get injured, we, we stop doing the workouts, and then we try again, and we just repeat the cycle. And what I like to focus on at We Shape, and what we focus on at We Shape in general is, is doing less than you think you need to do, building that strong foundation, being consistent with that, and really developing that deep connection with the body. And so, for example, if you were to do a we shape workout on level one, uh, all the most beginner movements that we have that you could literally do if you couldn't sit up, sit up from bed, um, I can almost guarantee that you're probably not going to hurt yourself doing that. It's very unlikely that you're going to do that workout and hurt yourself. And if you did that consistently for a few weeks or a month, and then you started scaling up the difficulty of some of the movements that you felt really comfortable with, um, then you'd start to build a little bit more strength, a little bit more coordination. And over time, if that's the plan you went with, is slowly increasing the difficulty of each movement, very slowly. You know, always kind of starting from this place of building a strong foundation, not pushing too far too fast, right? Then that's how we make progress with people who have consistent aches, pains, injuries, you know, uh, all the issues that you've mentioned. And there's probably a lot of people who are watching this that have suffered from this. Um, I wish I could give you a super simple roadmap to be able to follow. Um, but that's kind of why we created WeShape in the first place was to give people that roadmap of here are the most beginner movements and the ability to slowly scale those up over time so we can build that strong foundation. But the, but the whole point is do less than you think you need to do, but still be consistent. Pick a few things that you feel like are the most impactful for you. Do them, but don't do them so hard that you end up hurting yourself. Do them consistently and then make sure there's a progression in place so that you're not just doing the same thing every day for a year. Maybe you're doing the same thing every day for a month and then we make it a little harder. And then we need to make it a little harder the next month. And we make it a little harder the next month. And that movement sophistication is what will get you the progress that you're looking for to help you um, gain that strength, flexibility, power, and coordination, balance and coordination, that you'll be able to do the things you want to in your daily life. But start slow. Start slower than you think you need to start. Pick like three movement snacks from this video. Do them every day for three weeks, twice a day, and see if that helps, right? And if you did too much there, then like less, 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 less. And if you do less, consistently for longer, for two years, for three years, you might be surprised how far you can go. Almost everybody, um, almost everybody thinks they can do more than they can in a year. But if you're consistent for five years, almost everybody doesn't understand how much you can get done in five years. And the biggest problem that we have in the fitness industry is that everything's measured in weeks. Everything's measured in days, right? And the reality is, it's, for most people, you've, you've taken decades to get to where you are. And it's just not reality to unwind that in, in, in 30 days, right? But it is a reality to wind that, unwind that in 300 days, right? Or to at least begin to feel enough effects of feeling good that you want to be consistent with that. So start slow, okay? Everybody's listening who's frustrated. Start slower than you think you need to start and be consistent and take care of yourself. And remember, it's not about changing how you look. It's not about hating your body and showing up for your workouts from that place. It's about wanting to change the way you feel. It's about being able to do these movements in a way that feels good to your body so that you want to do them more, right? So remember that when you're approaching these. Okay. <clears throat> Julie, as a woman in menopause, I know that low estrogen contributes to my aching joints and my meno belly. It's hard to exercise to get healthy when you're aching um, to begin with. What do you recommend? I, you know what, Julie, I'm just going to roll you into that same answer last time. Like, start smaller than you think you need to start. Sorry, I can't elaborate more on that one, but, you know, if you guys want to try out WeShape, <laughs> go to weshape.com backslash question or click the links above and below or in our profiles. I think it'll be a game changer for people who feel confused. Just as long as you start with the most basic stuff, if it's too hard, scale it down and just be consistent for a while, all right? Um, okay, Donna, I recently retired to focus on my health. I meditate every day, 30 minutes of yoga, walk for an hour. Um, is body weight bearing exercises I can do at home enough? Uh, okay, so like I'm watching this 
Walking's not beneficial. So yeah, I think walking's beneficial um, only if you walk correctly, like I had mentioned earlier in this video. Um, and this, this question of like, do I need to go to the gym, lift weights, whatever? I don't think so at all. Gymnasts are some of the strongest people in the world and they don't lift any weights, they just do their body weight, right? And I think that um, if, you're, if you understand how to progress uh, through body weight movements, meaning you can make them harder, right? So again, if I'm doing a squat, I start out, I'm using my arms like this, and then I go to this, and then I add you know, a toe extension for the next level, then I add a hop, and then I jump even higher, or I can move to doing single leg variations of all of these things, right? If you understand a progression, then there's no need for weights, machines, gyms, any of that stuff, right? All you need is the information and the progression that's clearly outlined so that you can slowly make progress over time. Um, so that, I don't think there's any need to go to the gym. You can get plenty with body weight programs. Um, I've done a lot of body weight programs over the years and I, I think it's a fantastic way to stay in shape. <clears throat> okay. Woo. Okay, Diana, I'm 84. How do I get over my fear of starting the program? I have no major physical limitations, just that major hindrance. Ooh. I really wanted to answer this question here because um, I was having a conversation the other day about, about um, motivation and consistency. And I think a lot of times, most people who are watching this have tried a lot of programs and you probably feel to yourself like, well, the problem is I don't know how to be consistent. And again, I've outlined this a lot in this video. I think the big problem here is that when you do a workout and you approach it from a place of negative emotions and feelings about yourself, um, you don't want to continue doing things that have negative emotions and feelings as the, as, the, as the fuel for the activity. But underneath all this stuff is something deeper, and I would just love everybody who's still here to just like question themselves on this. Like, if you genuinely feel like you're worth showing up for, then you'll show up for yourself. But if you consistently make everyone and everything else more important than you, then you won't show up for yourself. And so you say you wanna show up for yourself and you wanna do a workout and you wanna do these things so you can feel better in your body, but you don't end up doing it. And I think that the difference between action and inaction in this circumstance is learning to appreciate yourself, learning to show up for yourself, learning to care for yourself. And I know there's a lot of women watching this probably right now. And women have been taught that from birth, you are measured by how you look in this world and what you do for others in this world, right? So either you've got to lose fat and you've got to like have the body it's given me for, the, for all the stuff it's carried me through and take all those images of who you think you should be and what you should look like out of the equation and just appreciate your body. Show it some appreciation for breathing all night while you slept and waking up the next morning still, you know? Show it some appreciation for being alive and carrying you through your entire life. And then show it some appreciation by showing up for a workout routine or a movement snack that will help it feel good. So build that connection with yourself and your body and, and really start to understand that um, when you care for your body from that place of self-care, you don't need motivation anymore. Because ultimately, at that point, you've decided, I'm worth it. I'm worth it. It's like brushing your teeth. I'm, these teeth are worth it. Why aren't your muscles and your joints worth it? All right? So sorry to be that kind of guy, but I think that everybody here needs to just go, I'm worth it, okay? All right, uh, we got a, core, a bunch of core questions, so I don't want to ignore this whole set of core stuff. So I had Diana, I had Ginny, I had Gerald, I had Christine, um, uh, Cindy, <coughs> uh, all talking about core movements, okay? I want to show you guys one simple core movement progression that could help pretty much most people who have these core issues. Um, and I'm going to start with the elevator, which I already taught earlier in the video, but I'm going to show you how to apply it to this core progression, okay? So this will give you another example of what a movement progression looks like, what motor pattern progressions look like. Again, this is the type of philosophy that we have at We Shape during our workouts, okay? So to start out with, we wanna learn how to activate the core and hold a position that creates core strength and stability. So it starts with fingers pushed into your belly button, do the elevator, so we're gonna push the fingers out against the belly button. If you missed that part, you can watch this video later and check that out, okay? From there, bend the knees, bring them up underneath your butt like this, okay? And then all we're gonna do here is keep the elevator pushed out, keep the lower back pushed into the ground, and we're gonna lift one knee up, and then we're gonna switch. Drop one knee down, and lift one knee up. So that elevator, that's kinda of like a level one. This right here, that's kinda of like a level two, okay? So, practice this movement if it feels like the right movement for you. If you're able to do this for 60 seconds while maintaining the elevator and keeping your lower back glued to the ground, then what we can do is bring both legs up, 
bend the knees to about 90 degrees, and this time, you're gonna drop one knee down and lift it back up while you keep it other one in the sky. This will be a level three, okay? Again, I'm showing you a movement progression. All right, so tapping the heels like that. Now, if you can do this for 60 seconds with perfect form, lower back pushing the ground, and the elevator active, then we're gonna keep the knees together at that 90 degree angle, and we're gonna drop the heels down to the ground together and back up. Uh, so this one's gonna be a little bit harder. Now, you're gonna know that you're not doing this right when your lower back goes whoop and lifts off the ground. Okay, so if your lower back lifts off the ground, you've gone too far, go back a level and focus on that variation of this core progression, okay? So here, we got 90 degree uh, reverse crunches. If you can do this for 60 seconds, then we're gonna straighten our legs to like a slightly bent position. So this is a slightly bent leg raise. Again, maintaining the elevator and the lower back. You're gonna drop your heels down, tap them to the ground with a slightly bent knees, and then back up, okay? If you can do this for 60 seconds, then we're gonna straighten the legs, point the toes, keep the quads fired the entire time. And then from there, we can take our hands this time. We know we've mastered the elevator at this point. You can put the hands underneath the butt and you can keep the legs straight and you're gonna bring them all the way down and back up, keeping the lower back glued in the ground. Again, if you can do this for 60 seconds with good form, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring our hands to the outside, like a T, like this, to the outside like this, same movement, okay? So I don't know, I haven't been tracking levels now, we're probably at like level seven or something like that, right? Okay, if we're able to do this for 60 seconds, now we're gonna take our hands, we're gonna put our arms overhead like this, and we're gonna do it like this, fully extended leg raises for 60 seconds. And if we're able to do this for 60 seconds, then we're gonna go from a fully outright hollow position to a tuck position like this and trying to balance on the tailbone and then come back out and repeat. And if we can do this for 60 seconds, then we're gonna to try to do V-ups for 60 seconds, which will be the top of our progression today, which is arms overhead, coming up with straight legs to the toes like this, okay? So as you can see, I just covered, um, gosh, I wish I would have kept counting the levels, but that was probably somewhere in like the eight or nine levels territory, right? <laughs> we had the elevator active for level one, we had the alternating legs for level two. Then we had the alternating legs with the knees active for level three. Reverse crunches for level four. Slightly bent leg raises for level five. Leg raises with hands on their butt for level, level six. Leg raises hands to the side for level seven. Fully extended leg raises for level eight. Tuck ups for level nine and V ups for level 10, okay? Now I wanted to show you guys this core progression <laughs> because this is kind of how the V-shaped workouts work. When you come to us, we will try to figure out which level is the right level for you. And as you do this level, we're gonna expose you to longer and longer variations of this movement. So you might start out with 20 seconds, and then it'll go to 30, 40, 60, and then all of a sudden, it'll take you back down to 20, and at that point, most people say, too easy, and it'll scale you up to the next level. And so your workouts over time are built so that you build that strength and that endurance in the movement, and then we bring it back down in duration, and then we increase the difficulty of the movement, and then we build the strength back up. And we repeat that over and over and over again on literally like I think 27 movements and 27 different stretches that we have in the WeShape program um, that are designed to help you feel better in your body. So if you wanna strengthen your core, that's, an, that's a perfectly simple core progression you could do. Um, a workout that you could try for that is um, really simple. Uh, the first week you could do 30 seconds of work, followed by 30 seconds of rest for three rounds of one of those variations. Now, keep on that variation. The next week, you do 40 seconds of work, followed by 30 seconds of rest for three rounds, and you do that three times again, right? So three times the first week, three times the next week. The next week after that, 50 seconds of work, 30 seconds of rest, and then on the fourth week, 60 seconds of work, 30 seconds of rest. So that'll only take you four and a half minutes three days a week, right? And then after that 60 seconds, go back down to 30 seconds and see if you can do the next move up, the next level up, right? And then you can repeat that process over and over again. That simple progression will absolutely change the way that your core feels. It's gonna make your core so much stronger because you've used a motor pattern progression which sophisticates the strength, the flexibility, the balance, and the coordination over time, which are the attributes that we at WeShape feel help you feel better in your body. Now, I know I got more questions here. Surprisingly, we didn't get through all the questions. I thought we'd have plenty of time to get through everything in three hours. Um, so I apologize if you guys asked a question and we didn't answer it um, today in today's q and I'm sure we'll be doing more Q&As, especially as the new year approaches. Um, I wanna make sure that everybody who's a fan of WeShape on our social media platforms 
has at least some of the tools that you need to feel better in your body again. It's so dang important for you guys to do something for yourself from that act of self-care like we've been talking about. Um, now, if you guys want We Shape to do the heavy lifting for you, like I said, um, as a thank you for joining this Cyber Monday call and for signing up for the Cyber Monday call, if you did sign up, um, we are doing a Cyber Monday deal, all right? And it's only the people on this call or the people who had signed up and registered for this call in advance, so it's only about 1,000 of you. It's 65% off any reshape plan. And something I didn't mention thus far on the call is that we are retiring this deal. So throughout 2023, we've done 65% off a handful of times, but it's not fair to the other members who are paying full price. So this is probably one of the last times, if not the last time we're doing the 65% off deal. We're definitely not doing it in 2024 anymore. We're gonna change it to a 35% off deal. So if you are not a member of WeShape, so this is for new members only, you can save 65% off your first um, payment of your WeShape uh, membership. All you have to do is click the link below or above if you're on YouTube or Facebook. Head on over to the link in our profile. You can click the link there. Or you can type in weshape.com backslash question and you'll be able to save that 65% off for another eight hours. But after eight hours, you guys, this is gone and you'll have to pay full price if you guys want to try out WeShape. But again, these are personalized follow along workouts that are um, personalized to your individual level using this movement progression I just showed you, kind of like I just showed you on this core move. Um, that move is actually in our workout routines, although I think there's more steps in our core progression. Um, it's gonna give you access to live Q&A calls, myself, Dr. Lisa, our We Care team. Um, it's gonna give you free access to our challenges. We have an amazing challenge coming up here very soon in January. And it's gonna give access to the community of people who are fed up of um, this traditional fitness methodology of kind of shaming you and making you feel crappy about the way you look so that you'll show up and do these workouts and instead trying to teach you how to stop having extrinsic motivation, stop needing to try and get validated outside yourself and start showing up for yourself and start building that self-worth and that appreciation for your body that you need to have that sustained motivation to be consistent because that's what matters is showing up for yourself from that sustained motivational place, being consistent and showing up as an act of self-care rather than self-judgment. So I, I hope you guys love this Q&A call. Thank you guys for joining us for three hours. Holy cow. Um, again, if you want to try WeShape 65% off, go to weshape.com backslash question, click the link above or below, or you can head over to the link in our profile and click that link and you guys can save 65% off for um, eight more hours. Uh, otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate everybody who jumped on this call and I hope you guys got something from the questions, a movement or a stretch uh, or anything that might help you feel better in your body. Um, and I'll see y'all next time, all right?